Okay. But now it's time, I think, to start. <laughs> yeah, it's having a tense day, so we should be going ahead. So good morning, everybody, and welcome. It's a great pleasure and honor to host How Can Industry Lead the Green and Circular Economic Transformation Conference today. This conference marks an important milestone in circular economy development in Lithuania. Since now we just talked and discussed about this topic, but with the prepared roadmap for Lithuania's industrial transition to a circular economy, um, is the first concrete and tangible national strategic document which opens a way for a circular industrial transformation in Lithuania. We are very grateful to European Commission for funding this uh, important high impact action for Lithuania. The uh, project officially started last year on the 1st of October, but a lot of hard work had to be done in advance, and today is the culmination of over two years of hard work. We are very pleased that such an intense co-creation based process is reaching its culmination, and we now have much anticipated results. The current state of the roadmap is that all the content and structure parts are in place and ready and only minor editorial adjustments are still needed. And by the beginning of next week, we'll have the final version. We would also like to take advantage of this high level conference today and possibility to incorporate uh, some relevant suggestions and proposals in the roadmap. Uh, once we get the final version, we will have it translated as soon as possible. And of course, we will share with all the international community who are interested in the development of industrial circular economy. Um, so we have a very intense um, and challenging day ahead of us, but I believe it will be very fruitful and very productive. The conference today is organized by the Ministry of Economy and Innovation together with the Industry 4.0 Competitiveness Platform. And the aim is to present a roadmap for Lithuania's industrial transition to a circular economy, the process, the lessons learned. Also, we want to discuss further the implementation part of the roadmap. Also to discuss some of the financing instruments and how the roadmap could facilitate um, um, the, Im the implementation of the EU Green Deal. And now I would like to share uh, the agenda of today. Okay, just let me find it and just give you some technical background. So I hope you can see my screen. And the conference today is uh, made of seven parts. The first part is dedicated to welcome speeches. On the second part, we discuss more about uh, the roadmap results and the process. The third part is uh, potential for green and circular economy, where we have presentations and the panel afterwards. Uh, when we have a lunch break, uh, and it's only 30 minutes, uh, uh, long, so I hope that you have all your meals ready because it's uh, it's going to be a very very short time. And uh, after that, uh, we switch to uh, Lithuanian language because the second part will be in Lithuanian. But interpretation is uh, provided, and if you just click, uh, uh, you, you can see on the panel below the interpretation link, and you just can switch to Lithuanian. Or if you don't want interpretation, you you just uh, uh, leave it and, and, and you just uh, get the, the language that is in, in the main room. And uh, of course, um, uh, if some uh, background noise uh, is uh, coming, you should press uh, the mute, mute button. Um, so, okay, yeah, stop sharing now. Yeah, and without any further ado, I would like um, to uh, start the first session. And uh, for, a for the first welcome speech and to open the conference, I invite Ms. Uh, Ms. Catherine Wendt, ahead of Unit G1 Smart and Sustainable Growth, Director General for Regional and Urban Policy at the European Commission. So Catherine, please. Thank you very much indeed. I'm very happy to be here. So very good morning, Deputy Minister, ladies and, and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting the European Commission. Thank you for inviting me to this final conference on Lithuania's industrial circular economy roadmap. It really is my pleasure to, to join today. I've very recently um, taken up this post. This is my first 
opportunity to enter into these issues with you. The pilot action on regions in industrial transition was launched at the beginning of 2018 in order to help regions undergoing industrial transition to develop new approaches to restoring their growth and productivity. We signed the agreement at the end of 2019 to give, uh, to, to give support to Lithuania's application. And two years on, uh, we meet at the closing conference today. In the application for the pilot action, the Ministry of Economy and Innovation noted that planning industrial transition is particularly challenging for Lithuania. Profound changes and transitions are never easy. You witnessed some fundamental changes in recent history, the economic, social and political transitions after regaining independence and when preparing for EU membership. And this experience will certainly be very helpful when anticipating the effects of future changes and adaptations, including the green transition. And the circular economy roadmap is a step in the right direction in addressing the green transitions challenge. And I would see this pilot action as cohesion policy's contribution to your efforts in advancing the green transition. Indeed, the cohesion policy is, in our view, an important instrument at our disposal. It's flexible in targeting both global challenges and local needs. And cohesion policy is also supportive of other policies. Many business, transport, digital and environmental projects financed in Lithuania receive support from the structural funds. And the same will no doubt happen in the new programming period. Having a circular economy roadmap that focuses on green transition and the ability of national authorities to steer funding to help with the green transition and circular economy is, I believe, significant. Let me uh, say some words of appreciation for the open dialogue and cooperation which I understand we have had on this project. It is your initiative and your project, there's no doubt about this, but beyond any formalities, the success of any project depends on open dialogue, and I'm happy to note the positive experience in this case. In a similar vein, open dialogue among national stakeholders will be key when implementing this plan. It will be crucial for the buy-in of all concerned in the implementation of the circular economy roadmap. I can share with you now that there were several considerations when the European Commission assessed applications received for financing industrial transition pilots. Among these were firstly the demonstrated political commitment and also the organisational readiness in preparing industrial and societal change that included the transition to a low carbon energy and circular economy. And I'm glad to note that these considerations were not only declarative, but were also demonstrated throughout the whole implementation of this pilot action. Yet political commitment is necessary, but not a sufficient condition for the successful implementation of any plan that targets global challenges, such as green transition and circularity. And this is why I stress again the importance of open processes, which are necessary to increase ownership over the roadmap and its actions. Delivering on the ambition expressed in the circular economy roadmap and bringing about positive change will not be easy. The good news is that there is a plan and there are means to support its implementation, such as making funding available via the cohesion policy instruments. There will certainly be many practical questions to answer and obstacles to overcome. These are important for the day-to-day -day operation but we should not forget why the transition to a circular economy is important and should bear in mind not only the costs of the transition, but also the cost of not going forward with the transition to a circular economy. Many steps had to be taken for us to be able to convene today. And I would like to commend and thank the project team for steering and bringing us all to this point today. I wish you uh, many interesting and productive exchanges uh, during uh, the day, during this conference, and of course, good luck for the implementation of this action plan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine, for your motivating and exciting speech. And we are once again, very grateful for European Commission for believing in us and funding this project. Thank you for letting us experiment in, in, in this way. And uh, for the second welcoming speech, I invite the Vice Minister of Economy and Innovation of the Republic of Lithuania, Ms. Egle Markevičiūdė.
Thank you so much. Um, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, congratulations to all those present at the, the final conference during which we're going to explore and uh, discuss how our industry can become greener and transform itself into the circular economy. Uh, so the main uh, uniting factor of us uh, today, as it was said already uh, many times before me, is the roadmap for the transition of Lithuanian industry to a circular economy developed on the principle of co-creation. Uh, with this roadmap, Ministry of Economy and Innovation seeks to outline the direction of the industrial transition towards uh, a circular economy and to give a strong impulse to the action plan of the circular economy of Lithuania and the Zasht and Lithu Lithuanian government's program. Um, today's international conference is an appreciation, first of all, of the fact that the Lithuanian industry is interesting and competitive internationally, and that our industrial players are successfully integrating into international value chains. More than 100 representatives from various organizations and institutions were involved in the process of developing the roadmap based on the principle of uh, co-creation, uh, such Involvement, of course, allows us to have a very objective and widely discussed guiding document. I'm sure that the circular and digital transformation will undoubtedly further uh, strengthen the role of industry in the general context of uh, Lithuanian economy, as well as boost the opportunities to create new business models and high value added jobs. Um, I want to thank all the experts, uh, all the experts from the ministry and elsewhere for um, an inspiring, uh, productive uh, work so far. And I wish you uh, an inspiring, a productive and proactive conference today. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Minister. And uh, for the third uh, welcoming speech, I invite uh, the acting director of uh, Agency for, for Science, Innovation and Technology, uh, Ms. Durute Bukovskaita. Can you hear me? Yes. It's okay. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's really, really, uh, for me, it's very important. So I would like to welcome everybody at this important online industrial circular economy conference. It is my pleasure to be with you, all of you today. The conference today marks an end of a hard work that took many months to produce a roadmap for Lithuania's industrial transition to a circular economy. Uh, the process involved many stakeholders from academia, business, governmental sector, and civic society. And the co-creation process was applied for the first time in Lithuania, in Lithuania. I would like to stress it, the first time in Lithuania. We are very honored that European Commission funded the project and that the Minister of Economy and Innovation believed and trusted the implementation of this high impact action project to the Agency for Science, Innovation and Technology, abbreviated META. I am also grateful and want to give a credit to experienced and dedicated META project managers who took good care of the project and ensured its success. META is a national innovation agency in Lithuania, which supports R&D based innovation development. And as we all know, innovations are extremely important in finding solutions to our current systemic worldwide problems. With no exception, successful circular economy deployment is highly dependent on innovations. With this project, we showed that we have competence not only in innovation management, but also in circular economy project management. And we are ready to continue the good and promising work by supporting R&D-based innovation in circular economy field as well as we have ambitions to become a competence center in circular economy in Lithuania. Climate change, pollution, and other ecological devastations spread beyond the borders and affect us all globally. And we truly believe that only by working together, we can find uh, the solutions we need. We also believe a circular economy encompasses 
all the features we need to have a successful, sustainable development, where we ensure economic growth by decoupling and from resource use, restore natural systems, and leave a healthy, habitable planet for future generations to thrive in. Uh, thank you very much for such <laughs> attendance. And I wish you a successful and inspiring conference today. Thank, Thank you, Birota. Thank you very much for your inspiring speech. It's great to know that Meta has several, uh, also further plans in, in circular economy. And uh, for the last but definitely not least uh, welcoming speech, I invite Mr. Vidmantas Yanulevich, who is the president of Lithuanian Confederation of Industrialists. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And I will try shortly to, to explain how can industry lead the transformation to a green and secular economy. Uh, dear guests, dear participants of the conference, uh, when discussing the challenges and changes brought by the fourth industrial revolution five years ago, we could not even imagine uh, what awaited us five years later. And the world uh, has turned, uh, turned uh, over the change just in the few days. The COVID pandemic accelerated all the transformation processes dozens of times faster. Uh, the global pandemic uh, has become a challenge for, the, uh, for both businesses and science. However, one of the positive effects has been uh, the acceleration of uh, digitalization processes in companies and the new areas of research and scientists. The COVID situation showed for the most of the business uh, what, is the, uh, what is the value that digitalization brings and the added value of businesses create themselves. These are opportunities uh, to make the economy resilient for the future. The whole Europe has learned uh, some painful lessons uh, and uh, now Europe is changing the brand made in China to brand made in EU, while Lithuania has become one of the winners in these processes last year and this year. One third of the new orders from the factories come to Lithuania precisely because of the refusal to work with the Asian suppliers. Now is the perfect time to make these processes uh, irreversible and uh, gains from Asia can stay here in Lithuania. The European Commission itself uh, has repeatedly declared that we must strengthen and shorten supply chains. Strengthen segments, healthcare, food industry, energy. This is the main, and of course, uh, everything related must be done through the information technologies. It all depends on us. If we do not implement and reach up the expectations of the customers, it is clear that we will lose them for sure. If we remain good partners, suppliers, processors, uh, or service providers for customers in Europe, our future will depend on it. The changes in the fourth industrial and green revolutions of great opportunities for the companies uh, to innovate technologically and solve pollution problems. This is very important. However, we must realize that some of industries cannot reduce their pollution to the zero based on their technology, and they already reach uh, some seals already. Uh, one of the other hand, uh, on the other hand, uh, the time is coming to develop now breakthrough technologies that also need to be supported attention and funding. The European Commission itself has acknowledged that such technologies are unfortunately at that time are very expensive. Uh, difficult to access and still in the development stage, unfortunately. We are talking of course about the hydrogen and another solutions who could help industry uh, to change fossil fuel. Of course, uh, we hear adjuments arguments that uh, we should abandon such industries. But we need uh, to think globally and acknowledge that uh, we will abandon such industries, uh, close our factories and buy the same products from the 
neighbor countries will create uh, will create the leakages of the industries. Um, and this is very important. Do not invest in the reduction of pollution, yeah, because uh, some and other countries doesn't care about uh, pollution and they will produce as cheap as possible with a fossil fuel. Change of technologies is a very expensive, risky and long lasting investments. Therefore, uh, high founding intensity is needed to help minimize potential risks and allow companies to contribute the green cause uh, of Lithuania and the European Union. Uh, without damaging the economic and social development of the regions. We, of course, uh, have some good examples. Here I mean uh, Ahema Group as the largest producer of traditional hydrogen in the Baltic states. The company will already implement a pilot project for the green hydrogen. Hydrogen is needed for them to produce the green ammonia, but in broad sense. It could also be a pilot project to produce products from hydrogen in HEMA. And if you look at even more broadly, such a project could help lay the foundations for Yonova City to become the first green city in the country. Increased investments in research, innovation, and state-of-art infrastructure would help to optimize industry, create new production processes and jobs, and would ensure stable economic growth during this period. We now have the opportunity to strengthen our economy and give industry a boost so that it keeps pace with rapidly changing technologies and, in, and is more uh, resi uh, resilient uh, to future crises, possible future crises. The success of our state, the success of, uh, the success of our state uh, of all of us depends on the ability of the public and private sectors to keep up with the never ending and ever accelerating marathon of digital transformation. History has shown many times that technological progress alone is rarely enough uh, to create greater added value. Investments in technologies must go hand in hand with even great investments in new business processes, skills and other types of integrable capital because this is the only way to ensure sustainable productivity growth. Lithuanian industrialists offer a new vision of the state, the green transformation. It could become a roadmap for the movement and changes across the country, but the next, during the next decade. The mechanisms proposed by EU gives us this opportunity to take the lead and become leaders in green transformation. We are a small, fast-growing economy with a with no clear direction to move by now. It is easier to restructure and move towards targeted goals for the, such economies. I wish you everything interesting for everyone, interesting discussions today and uh, beautiful hope bringing year ahead. It's difficult to believe with such a challenges which we have now that year will be easier than last ones, but nevertheless, I wish you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vidmantas, for the very detailed and interesting speech. And uh, it's very, it's good to know that you believe that circular economy has potential in Lithuanian industry. So thank you. Thank you once again. And uh, I also would like to thank all the uh, honorable guests for inspiring, welcoming speeches and also for finding time in your busy agendas. Uh, and now we continue with the program and we start with the second session, which is dedicated to uh, the roadmap and uh, and uh, concrete results. And for the first presentation, I invite our project expert and methodological coordinator, Mr. Richard Harden. So Richard, please. Thank you very much. Let me let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see that okay? Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. So, uh, yes, as Seema says, I'm, I'm, uh, beat, I was hired by um, the European Commission to act as um, uh, the coordinator for the High Impact Action. Um, I don't represent the Commission myself. I'm an independent person uh, hired for this specific purpose. 
but I was hired by them also before uh, this to work on the pilot action on industrial transition, uh, which lasted between 2018 and uh, 2020. And Lithuania was, uh, as we heard before, was one of the 12 pilot regions chosen uh, for this pilot action. It's a joint initiative by uh, the European Commission with OECD. And during the process, uh, OECD identified five key industrial transition challenges, uh, which you see on the screen there. Um, uh, preparing the jobs for the future, that is in the context of uh, a world of increasing uh, digitalization, um, robotization, in, uh, artificial intelligence and other new technology, uh, really, you know, having to run fast in order to keep pace uh, with this, um, broadening the diffusion of innovation, so it's not just in the, uh, um, among the, the star technological uh, companies, high uh, income companies, but also more for everybody. Um, uh, promoting entrepreneurship and engagement of the private sector, supporting the transition to a low carbon and circular economy and inclusive growth. So that's uh, basically dealing with the effects, the employment and the social effects of industrial transition, which can be a, a negative thing that needs to be taken care of. Uh, and in all of this, this supporting the transition to the low carbon circular economy, uh, it, turned, it turned out to be, during the pilot initiative, it turned out to be a, a key transversal driver for strategies for, for just about all of the regions concerned. And as we, as we see, of course, Lithuania's high impact action uh, is very much uh, in that theme. Uh, also important to note that one of the purposes of the of the whole uh, industrial transition pilot was to uh, help regions with the enhancement of their smart specialization strategies and to feed into the programming for uh, cohesion policy uh, for the next period 2021 to uh, 27. Um, and uh, each of the 12 pilot regions, you see them there on the picture, uh, they, uh, at the end of the action, they were able to develop a high impact action. They got a special grant from the Commission in, in order to do this. And uh, four of them, uh, I could say, uh, ended up being in the circular economy field somehow, connect or, or somehow connected with it. Um, in Northeast Finland, uh, they, they had a, their action was focused on the um, tree, wood and timber value chain, and they were uh, looking to promote digitalized, uh, but very much circular economy solutions uh, in that field. And they came up with some, in, some interesting uh, and amazing, in fact, uh, uh, ideas to, uh, to boost uh, growth on the basis of circular value chains. North Middle Sweden, um, this was a challenge lab uh, connected with the C Fund on low carbon and uh, circular approaches um, uh, with a very much of, of a focus on society, how, how society deals with a, a low carbon economy. Uh, in Belgium and Wallonia, they, they had a specific focus on, uh, on the plastics industry bringing the um, producers and consumers together in uh, trying to look for circular solutions in plastics. And then of course, Lithuania. So the roadmap for the industrial transition to circular economy. And of, the, of those four, uh, Lithuania's is indeed the, the, the fullest uh, approach uh, to circular economy, the widest ranging uh, of, uh, of them all. So that's just a little bit of the, of the context behind this. Um, the project itself, uh, so we have the projects led by the Ministry of Econ Economy and Innovation uh, and implemented by uh, Agency for Science and Innovation and Technology, META, as we know. Uh, we had two uh, expert teams working on it. Uh, one international team, uh, that was Circle Economy. They are a, a Dutch uh, or a non-profit organization and they've been involved in a wide range of circular economy analyses and strategies for uh, regions, countries, uh, uh, cities, uh, also involved in the uh, pro producing the circular economy gap report at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Um, we have the Lithuanian expert team made up of Eco Consultajos, which is a, a specialist uh, uh, 
um, consultancy in uh, environmental uh, promoting environmentally friendly aspects of business, Kaunas Technological University, um, and uh, and then they coordinated. That's me. So yes, that's uh, uh, this external person uh, contracted by DG Regio. And what I did during the project, I chaired a steering group, uh, bringing together these different players uh, and the implementation as we went through and I have to say it's been a pleasure uh, to work with uh, a great team of people you see it's quite a diverse team uh, and uh, it it was really um, has worked I think very well uh, we had a few delays a few little problems but you always get things like this in a project um, and at the end of the day I think that we have a result which is going to be uh, of high impact. Um, the main components were uh, an analysis of the um, of the industrial sectors in uh, Lithuania. Okay, so that uh, comp comprised a policy analysis, an analysis of the flows of materials throughout the system, uh, and a circularity survey of businesses. How ready are they? How open are they to to adopting more circular principles? There were four to uh, some six um, particular sectors were, were focused upon uh, as an illustration. We will, I'm sure other presenters will go into that uh, a, a bit later on. And all of that took place uh, through um, a, a spirit of consultation at the end. Um, towards, it was the beginning of July this year, the analysis was actually formally endorsed. Uh, the analysis was done by the international team uh, at Circle Economy with support from the Lithuanian expert team. And it came out at the end with a few um, main policy proposals um, for how to bring this uh, circular economy roadmap forward. Uh, those proposals were then worked on further by the ex Lithuanian expert team to bring them into the uh, Lithuanian context. And the important aspect here, which has been mentioned, is this process of co-creation, which uh, the Lithuanian expert team orchestrated um, to uh, further refine the policy proposals and look at how those uh, policies could be implemented, who would own them, what would be the schedule, uh, how might they be financed and so on. So this co-creation process uh, uh, took place uh, on, on all of that. Uh, they end up with an endorsement of uh, the findings of that and uh, finally an adoption of the roadmap, which is kind of where we are at the moment. We're almost at that stage, a final formal adoption of this roadmap at the end of this, uh, at the end of this year. And so what, uh, what actually makes this a high impact action? Uh, what is its value uh, for uh, tr industrial transition at the end of the day? I think there are a few things we can say. I mean, the first one is that circular economy, certainly at the time that we began this, was an entirely new policy field for Lithuanian industry. So you're going to have a high impact action, a high impact uh, in that sense, um, uh, obviously. Uh, and then I think the other thing is this co-creation process. Um, uh, it was a new methodology for uh, developing policy for Lithuania. Uh, and I think the other thing to, uh, to note is that all of this circular economy transition is about system change. You know, you can't carry on, you can't really make it towards a circular economy just carrying on business as usual. So it's about uh, new ways in which businesses interact with each other, new ways in which government ministries uh, work with each other and other government agencies. Uh, and the key elements, I think, in all of that would have be would be the international practice that we brought into the circular economy, circularity analysis through the international team, uh, and this experimental co-creation process. You know, so you many many different people involved from government sector, uh, science, academic sector, businesses themselves, and their uh, and their um, support organisations and associations, various other interest groups. And I think uh, at one point there were some 700 people were identified in the in the circular economy ecosystem. And of course, finally, the key element, the key element is that uh, a strong ownership, government ownership at a high level in order to take this forward. 
So, uh, well, we are not alone, okay? This picture is from a couple of years ago, so I think there's probably more green on it than there, than there was uh, then, but uh, the green bits uh, um, representing places in, in Europe which have a circular economy action plan or roadmap or strategy either in place or under development. Uh, and as you see, a, a lot of the map is turning green. Uh, and um, so it's, this is just to show that, you know, you're very much not alone. What's happening here is very much in line with what's happening all over Europe. And I just leave a few of the main references. You may, you probably already know them, but I just put them there um, uh, because that's, there's an opportunity to do that. The two uh, EU circular economy roadmaps, a very important background here. Um, uh, as is the uh, Green Deal uh, and uh, more practical reference to the European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform. Okay, I will leave it there uh, and let others uh, speak. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. I would also like to encourage the audience, if you have any questions, just raise your hand and you can ask it directly or you can type it in our chat. So, um, before we jump uh, into Lithuanian context, we are very pleased that we have a representative from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, Ms. Claudia Hwals, who is an innovative citizen participation lead at the OECD's Open Government and Civic Space Unit, and will give us a more of a global context on innovative citizen participation and decision-making process. So Claudia, please. Wonderful. Thanks very much for inviting me to, to speak at your conference today. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here and also really interesting for me to, to hear about what you've been doing because, as you can tell from the introduction, probably I'm not uh, an expert on the circular economy. Uh, what I do is I lead the OECD's work on innovative citizen participation. Uh, so it's been really interesting and exciting to hear about um, all, of the, all of the work that's been done to involve stakeholders in the development of this um, circular economy plan um, and what I will offer is a little bit of a perspective about how to how to, how to sort of build on on this momentum to open up perhaps even further uh, by involving not just stakeholders but also citizens now that there's been some experience also with the with the positive benefits of, of being open of co-creation uh, and so on so I will share um, my screen here I have a few slides I'll be sharing some um, I'll be sharing some, there we go, can you see? Yes, um, I'll be sharing some reflections from the, the work we've been doing uh, also with my colleague uh, Yeva Chesnatite, who is here with us in, in the meeting here today um, on deliberative democracy in particular and deliberative approaches to, to bringing in everyday people into, into policy making on complex topics. Um, so to, to begin, just wanted to start by sharing the OECD's um, definition about the three pillars of stakeholder participation participation, uh, which are defined in the OECD's recommendation of the Council on Open Government. Um, and in this definition, stakeholder is defined quite broadly, uh, referring to, I think, what we consider as traditional stakeholders like companies, trade organizations, civil society organizations, but also, also citizens. Um, and there's the, the three pillars are information. So this is really an initial level of participation, more of a one-way relationship, on-demand provision of information, and as well as some proactive measures to disseminate information. Um, a second pillar, uh, which is more advanced, is consultation, which uh, is more of a two-way relationship. It requires the provision of information, but also feedback on the outcomes of the process. Um, and what I will focus on in this presentation is rather engagement. Um, so that thing that kind of goes the furthest uh, in this space. So it's when stakeholders, including civis, citizens and civil society, are given an opportunity and the necessary resources to collaborate during all phases of the policy cycle and in service design and delivery. Um, and just very briefly before I, I go into some of our work more specifically, I also thought it was worth kind of defining what is the difference between involving stakeholders and involving citizens, um, as it's, it's, it's really quite different. And I think to, to many people who are perhaps a bit less familiar with citizen engagement, it's worth going over a little bit. I'm, I mean, this is just to say both are necessary and important, um, but they're just different. Um, so 
involving citizens as opposed to stakeholders um, means that you're you're bringing in a public opinion as well as public judgment if you create the conditions um, for people to come to more informed points of view. Um, there's a greater diversity of views that can be brought in as well as rarely heard voices. Um, it can be designed to be broadly representative of the public. Um, it requires public communication though as well as leading to the potential of public learning about the issue um, and can help lead to some tailor-made and effective solutions. Um, but in order for this to really be possible, there are some considerations. Um, so involving stakeholders usually has a much lower threshold for participation um, since they are used to participating um, in all sorts of consultations. They have often uh, resources, time, dedicated teams um, that have interactions with governments. Um, so there's a very clear interest and incentive for them to take the time uh, to participate in a consultation. And because they already have this experience, it's also something that's less daunting and um, there's a, a known role in decision-making. Um, whereas to involve citizens, um, it requires really breaking down the barriers to participation. Um, so creating the conditions for people to feel like it's worth their time to participate. It involves um, creating conditions potentially such as paying people an honorarium for their time. Um, if it's an in-person event or gathering, thinking about things like covering people's transportation costs or providing childcare. Um, it's also important to, to motivate um, people's um, people to participate. So creating really a meaningful opportunity for, for their voices to be heard, which requires a clear link to decision making um, and often works best when an invitation comes from, from a high level figure. Um, and what I will what I will go into now, um, it focuses on citizen participation, um, is the so a few findings and and a bit of the um, reflections that we've had from the the main uh, flagship report that we published at the OECD last year, uh, innovative citizen participation and new democratic institutions catching the deliberative wave. Um, so this is a report that I, I co-authored with Yeva Chesnajite. Um, it's the first empirical comparative study of representative deliberative processes for public decision making um, and I will define exactly what I'm talking about by that in a moment. Um, it includes 289 examples which date from 1986 uh, including 18 OECD countries and the international level. Uh, the examples come from all levels of government. Um, we've identified greater nuance in 12 different models of deliberative processes as well as 11 principles of, of good practice. Um, and perhaps as a way to, to make this idea of what is a representative deliberative process less abstract, I'll, I'll define it with an example. Um, so here are some images from uh, the Poznań Citizens Panel in Poland, uh, which took place earlier this year. Um, and it was a panel about how can Poznań authorities act to counteract and adapt to climate change and the climate crisis. Um, and within this framework, there were two very specific follow-up questions about how to adapt the forest and green areas in Poznań to the changing climate, um, as well as do you want to be do you want to completely abandon coal burning in households in Poznań? Um, so there were 20,000 invitations that had gone out across the entire city uh, and amongst everybody who, who responded positively to this invitation to participate in the citizens panel, there were 70 people who were chosen to be broadly representative um, of Poznań's population and they met numerous times between the 18th of February and the 22nd of May. Um, so that's about four, four months uh, to be able to hear from lots of experts and to come up with some very specific recommendations for the Poznan City Council about how to tackle this question. Um, so for instance, um, they had said that by the end of 2022, there needs to be a plan in place so that coal can be completely eliminated in Poznań by 2027, um, which is much more ambitious in terms of the timeline than the national government's plan for phasing out coal at the moment. So just one example of, of the sorts of processes of the 289 examples, um, they all meet certain criteria um, of a representative deliberative process. And so what this means is that at the, at the starting point, there's a public authority which has a problem. Um, this problem is formulated as a clear task in the form of a question. So in this example, how can poison authorities act to counteract and adapt to climate change and climate crisis? 
um, to choose the, the citizens assembly or citizens panel or citizens jury. Um, people are chosen through a process called the civic lottery. So briefly, as I had just described, this means that there's a two-stage sortition process. Um, and this sort of, of, uh, of recruitment method might sound very, very elaborate or very difficult, but it's really done in a way to try and counteract that problem that comes up, I think, over and over and over again in many different contexts about how do we get beyond the type of people who always show up to a town hall meeting or who fill in every consultation or who we hear from all the time, how do we reach those people who are from underrepresented groups who we are not hearing from today? And so a civic lottery allows that to happen because in the first instance, the invitation, um, in this case, it was from the mayor, it's usually from the person with authority, gets sent to a very large number of people in the population. Um, and this letter explains, you know, what the process is about, what is their task, when will there be a response to their recommendations, and so people then volunteer to opt into this lottery or not, and amongst everybody who says yes, um, a final group is again randomly chosen, uh, but this time controlling to be broadly representative of the community concerned, um, and so it's a way to bring in those people who may have never voted, have never gone to a town hall meeting, um, are not involved in politics, um, you bring them into such a process with this methodology. So once you have this group, <clears throat> sorry, once you have this group brought together, they go through roughly three phases. Um, first being orientation and learning. Uh, so they first have a lot of time to first understand what this process is about and also to, to learn and to hear from a broad variety of experts as well as stakeholders. So I want to emphasize that within these processes, stakeholders actually play a very important role. Um, but instead of having their say kind of directly to the public authority, they have to present their evidence to the, to the broadly representative group of citizens. Um, and so this usually takes place over, over numerous days, as well as through providing written or, or material or videos that people can also watch or read in their own time. Um, after that, there's, a, uh, there's deliberation. So deliberation means uh, weighing the evidence that's been, um, that's been received and also trying to, to find common ground with the people who are part of this process. So there's that really explicit aim to come to a collective decision together on what will be their recommendations. Um, so it's very different to many other citizen participation processes because it's not an aggregate of individual people's views. Um, it's a collective set of recommendations and it's after a process where they've had usually numerous days over numerous months. So it's not just a public opinion, it's more of a public judgment on the issue. And the process doesn't end there, it ends with the response then of the public authority to those citizens assemblies recommendations. And we've seen that the use of these sorts of processes to involve everyday people in policy making has really been gaining momentum since 2010. Um, so the earliest processes, as I said, were, were in the 80s, but we've seen over the past two years alone, um, we, we recently actually, I'm, I'm showing you the data from the report to avoid some confusion, but we have also recently updated this database um, just last month. Uh, so it has 574 examples now, um, and over a hundred of them were just from the past two years years. Um, so I say this because it's something that we're really seeing happening more and more often as a trend to overcome some of those typical challenges to citizen participation that I mentioned earlier. Um, we found these examples at all levels of government. I think sometimes there's a myth that public deliberation works best for the local level and we obviously have a lot of examples there which makes sense. There's many more municipalities in the world than there are countries um, but I do want to stress we have a lot of, of examples at that national and federal level as well. Um, and public authorities have commissioned these processes for really a wide range of policy issues, um, ranging from things like urban planning, health, environment, strategic planning, infrastructure, um, as well as, as you see in the notes here, really like a wide range of issues. So one of the things we found was that actually there's all sorts of policies that have been addressed in this way. And to help policymakers identify when is it useful to do something like this, um, the types of problems that are well suited to deliberative processes um, have three characteristics typically. So one being that they are values-based dilemmas. So a lot of problems, um, public problems that we think of, sometimes we think of them as technical issues, but actually underneath them, there's a lot of values-based questions that 
touch upon actually what kind of society do we want to live in? How do we want to live together in a community? Um, and I think actually a transition to a circular economy does end up raising some of those bigger questions. Um, on top of that, it's also a, an example of a, a complex problem that requires trade-offs. Um, so these processes are particularly well suited when um, you know, there's multiple ways forward. There's not just one evident easy way or only a binary set of options. And it's about trying to consider that wide range of, of possibilities and trying to identify the trade-offs of you know, where are we willing to find some compromise. Um, and the third being long-term questions um, because having these processes in place can help overcome some of those short-term um, short incentives of elections. Um, I'm not, I, won't, I won't go into this into too much detail because of time, but I did want to flag that uh, on the basis of all of this empirical research, we've developed the OECD good practice principles for deliberative processes for public decision making. Uh, so we have a fair amount of evidence kind of a what works. Um, so things like having a very clearly defined purpose, um, having accountability that there's actually follow up to the recommendations, you know, having enough time. Uh, on average, these processes last at least four full days over the course of six weeks, and many of them are longer. Um, so so th these are detailed fully in, in the report. Um, and finally, I will leave on the fact that um, since we published this last year with my colleague Yeva and our wider team, we've also been um, developing other tools for policymakers in this field. Uh, so we published recently the evaluation guidelines for these processes, uh, which in many ways operationalize the good practice principles and give a bit more detail to policymakers about how to, how to actually organize and design and implement such a process. Um, and then just last week, uh, we published published, or this week actually, we published a new paper about eight ways to institutionalize deliberative democracy, uh, because the latest trend that we're seeing uh, is a move from public authorities to not have just a one-off initiative, um, sort of like the Poznan example I just told you, but actually thinking about how can we embed public deliberation so that it becomes a part of how we make public policies on an ongoing basis. Um, so there's there's eight different models that we've identified with examples from all sorts of places, ranging from Paris, where I am, to Toronto, Brussels, Bogota, uh, and others. So the, the kind of concluding thought that I would like to leave you with um, is that I'm not suggesting by any means that deliberative processes are some sort of silver bullet, uh, but we do have a lot of evidence which shows that if they are designed well, they're able to bring public judgment to democracy and help solve complex public problems and increase public trust. So thanks very much for, for your attention and I'm very open to, to your questions and, and reflections. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today, Claudia. Um, it's a very interesting and important topic, um, how to involve citizens in public decision-making process. And the civic lottery you mentioned was a new concept. I had never heard about it before. So it's very, very interesting to know more about this. And indeed, I think that um, uh, successful circular economy development requires participation of all civic society. So thank you once again for sharing methods on how, how to do that. So do we have any questions from, from the audience? I don't see any raised hands or any in the chat. So if not, then thanks again, Claudia, and we move, move on. And now I give the floor to Ms. Lina Shlinataita Kaleda, who is an environmental expert, sustainability networker, social designer, a change facilitator. And uh, she will share with us the co-creation process of the roadmap and, and the lessons learned. So, Lena, please. Thanks, Simas. I would like to thank Claudia for, for broadening our understanding about engagement and, and co-creation. And it's really a future. And thanks, Inga, uh, in Yava Chesnulitite for bringing the agenda of engagement into our government. And I will introduce in short how we try to bring the whole system of stakeholders of circular economy in Lithuania. We gathered a lot of people which are in power, having authority, resources, money, experts, people that have information or may be affected by the outcomes of circular roadmap. We proposed this quite experimental uh, method to Ministry of uh, Economy and Innovation and META and European Commission, and, and they accepted that. They were so brave to accept that. And um, 
it's really a new and innovative method for Lithuania, for young democratic country to apply such a systematic dialogue and co-creation, because we are here more dealing with top-down or consultation approach, as, as Ms. Claudia were, were ex in explaining. So we thought that it's important for such a complex topic as circular economy to have different representatives from competences, levels of hierarchy and interest, and to have really open, systematic and constructive dialogue. So we have two processes in parallel. So national agreement on forest, which was initiated by Ministry of Environment, and this first vision of Lithuanian industry-based trying to base it on co-creation level. So everybody understand through the process, and I got a lot of reflections, that people understand that we need to shift from linear to circular and sustainable economy, and it's a full system change. It's a, because we are dealing with really, really complex interconnected challenges. And the realization of circular economy will require really fundamental transformation, not only in economic sectors and along numbers and dimensions. It will require our totally shift in thinking. So this requires many parts to, go con to be contributing in a positive way, but also system-wide coordination of all those parties. So we really understand, and people were reflecting, that we need to have system-level awareness. We need to have shifted our thinking towards from, from reduc reductionist thinking to, towards system thinking. And everybody was mentioning uh, uh, in the emails that they understand that we need to shift the way we talk and listen to each other. So the process, um, the process really brought, I think, us common understanding and alignment of intentions. That was initial justification of the process, and I think we reached uh, some of the goals. We had those interest roles and relations, so we integrated top-down and bottom-up initiatives, and we really tried to accelerate mindset transformation in the leading industries. They can send, see themselves if we achieve that or not. And this is the process of changing the system from within. So it means we need trust within the system. And without listening and talking in one room at a time, we cannot build a trust for the future implementation of the roadmap. The other interesting thing which was incorporated in our process was single, double and triple loop, loop learning, which is important to create conditions for shared um, sharing and learning among participants, which leads to common understanding. So uh, I think we created open platform, quite open, while, uh, while the problem was that we had now no time to design the whole process with all stakeholders. But I think we can do that the next time. So we really have committed, committed people. These are the slides, open faces, and, and people were really participating. And we got 700 participants in process. And these were politicians, representatives of ministries, association science, non-governmental sectors, municipalities, public sector experts, industry, businesses, consumers. So we had four stages. First, we did stakeholder map, policy analysis, secularity, and we got coordination group. Then we were building common context. It was really interesting part where we got experience from the past and we really tried to, to understand what we can what we can bring from the from the past, what is what are our roots of circular economy. Then we have co-creation and future search methodology for vision, scenario building, and strategic directions. And then the draft roadmap came with also, you know, coming back to interest lobbying proposals and consultations. Some people were very enthusiastic, like Stasis. And I think because he was waiting for so long just to be heard. And uh, all the process was following three rooms of changes. People afraid, people don't like changes. So we got a lot of things. And this metaphor of, of four rooms can, be described, can describe our process. A lot of people um, as a group and as a facilitator, I experienced denial because we were facing process that disturbed the status quo the hierarchy, position, and ego of some people. And some people experience frustration, anger, excitement, and always move to confusion phase. And only in confusion phase, we are having the shift in, 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 in and transformation. So if we live in, with anxiety, with these problematic uh, you know, emotions, then we can shift our thinking. And we were a lot of times 
in this in this confusion phase in the process. And it was it was always going and going from denial to renewal and and, and so on. So and our our task as experts were to see where we can where we can leverage the this industrial transformation. Are we are we planning just to change the technical leverage, just to distribute money for some technical issues? Or we are planning to shift our system on a human leverage point, or we are we are we are ready to think about new, totally new um, paradigm with a value based. And I think we we manage somewhere between technical and human leverage, and, and people can answer where we ended up within the road roadmap. Um, so results are important, not only material, what we have on paper, but also intangible. So better interpersonal relations, support from varieties groups, increased awareness, understanding, consumers were for the first time and NGOs were already uh, within us. So we have coordination group, which can be a basis for the for the future platform. These are these people can be the keepers of the Lithuanian circular industry idea because 50 people were meeting about 30 times, and it was it was a lot for Lithuanian context. And this is this is what we have about 50 members and women, men, equal distribution, and also representatives from all the all the stakeholders. And also we had some international uh, people bringing us the concept because we understand through this, through this process that we need a basic knowledge and understanding. This is where we need to start, starting from concept, what it means for the Lith for Lithuanian industry, and then sharing experience and uh, looking on the common grounds for the future. So we, we got these uh, essential directions and um, um, of course leadership of our, of, of our institutions and uh, um, we, we also talked about we need to eliminate the consequences of linear economy and, and to get rid of burden to our society of some of the industrial processes. We also talked about stakeholder platform centers of excellence and moving the methodologies the best methodologies from from europe and the world and also good regulatory and financial environment and also to keep this experimentation and cooperation um, culture so the main lessons learned from stakeholders what they mentioned uh, that some people call the process just a game because the decisions anyway will be taken by those in power and nobody will accept that what is co-created. So some of the people didn't trust the process and left a certain point because they, they still think after this process that lobbying and consultations are more effective or they are more used to that. So people also mentioned uh, in the emails while reflecting that, um, you know, um, it's better for us these business as usual process. Thanks, Lena. We got this game, but it's not for us. Some people didn't like me as facilitator because I was too autocratic on, on too much leading the process. Some people say it's too long, too heavy, too tough, and to listen to other opinions, especially those who has nothing to say. Some people hate some personalities and ask to exclude from the process. Some very participative people were just observing and silent within the processes, and everybody mentioned that. A lot of people noticed how how we are separated from one another using our ego, hierarchy, laws, or other walls that prevent us from listening and evolving. So these were a lot of um, testimonials about the process, which I think they are very important to, to, to look at and to, to use this experience in the, further, in the further processes. Some people were saying that thanks a lot for this moving to, from ego system to echo thinking, you know, and uh, they, they asked, they said that thanks for this creating boundaries for experimental culture because not everything can be put completely on paper and um, it's it's a time where it is complex we need to experiment so there is flexibility in our proposal in roadmap where companies can really experiment and uh, a lot of people were saying that we need to have a good measuring system for uh, for our for our you know progress uh, measure our equality in the system, how well are the parts connected, measure degree of cooperation, measure these things that are not, not measured at the European even level. And some people were saying that they need a live st stakeholder platform instead of dead committees and working groups. So uh, I like Thomas Dotsus uh, saying that this co-creation process for him, it was like atomic bomb because tolerance for each other emerges. And he said that it was a very strong uh, experience. And I think 
everybody undergo in this process uh, their own individual organizational or or and we we will uh, we undergo the process of as a secular community and i hope that the spirit will continue in implementation of the roadmap thank you thank you lina for this very sincere and open reflection and also i would like to thank you and all the lt expert team for bringing this cooperation to lithuania and uh, I hope that uh, it's be it will be like a flagship, you know, and all the other strategic documents will be only made in, in this way. So I'm just looking. Uh, do you have any questions? I don't see any. But um, maybe just a quick, uh, Lina. Uh, I don't know, maybe if it can be quick, uh, based uh, on your experience and and um, uh, your expectations before the process. How do you define the end result? Was it a success story or um, more of uh, you know some other things to 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 clear in the way during the future events. Thanks so much, but I think these are pioneering processes, and I'm just facilitator, you know, just facilitator. So I will leave this answer to everybody which participated in the process. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I see in the chat that Claudia shared her um, report. So if people are interested, you can. Uh, go directly to the link and she also provided her email for, for uh, further questions. Um, we continue now with our program and now I invite uh, Ms. Janeta Stashkiene, who is a professor and um, from, from Konas Technology, Technology University and she will share the main results of our uh, Lithuania's Industrial Circular Economy Roadmap. So Janeta, please. Sorry, we can't hear you. Okay, now you can hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, before starting uh, introducing this main um, result of our uh, common uh, activities, common work of after a lot, lot of uh, discussions, uh, I would like to highlight that, that I am we uh, I and my all the team of Lithuanian experts are really happy to have such a great support uh, from the welcome speeches part because it seems like it's uh, this roadmap is so important for all levels uh, uh, in Lithuania and uh, of course for uh, industry because industry uh, will be the main receiver and performer and implementer of all activities uh, we created together and um, as lena already mentioned it was a, it was a long and complicated uh, process with uh, pros and cons but finally we have this systematical evaluation and um, working together uh, getting this uh, result and uh, uh, maybe some of you already saw this because we are we are discussing uh, the roadmap as a such uh, uh, several times but for those who never uh, hear about the process I just want to uh, remind that uh, in preparation stage we have uh, great support from international experts from uh, Netherlands circle economy which helped us to, pro, uh, to perform policy analysis, material flow analysis, analysis of Lithuanian industry circularity, uh, feasibility, and to, together uh, with uh, us, with Lithuanian experts, uh, we developed uh, recommend recommendations. And on our side, um, we performed uh, analysis of EU policies, legislation, and funding mechanism, which are related with circular economy uh, implementation in uh, Lithuania and especially in Lithuanian industry, uh, analysis of Lithuanian policy, legislative and financing mechanism. Ma we made a map of circular economy ecosystem, which I, we believe help, will help a lot uh, in the future development and decisions. And uh, also uh, we made an uh, analysis of roadmap processes and documents. Of course, together uh, with the experts and also based on the uh, EU priorities, we agreed on the demo sectors, uh, which uh, we have um, 
food and agriculture, textile, furniture, plastics and packaging, and construction. And of course, it uh, was a great support uh, for this uh, process to be successful. And we have really uh, effective tool for industry and collaboration between uh, most important uh, in this process, Lithuanian ministries. We have the Circular Economy uh, Coordination Group, and uh, therefore uh, we uh, introduced co creation uh, process, helped a lot to perform and to uh, define essential areas for the change in the transformation of Lithuanian industry into a circular economy. And uh, these are the like a short introduction of main documents. Uh, which we are uh, as a basis for the roadmap development, and we divide it into the two levels. So EU level, and you see here the main documents, which are um, for a short and long term uh, developments and changes. Uh, so Lithuania is an important part of um, uh, EU and uh, we have to follow the main goals, uh, uh, EU goals, which we are defined up to two, uh, 2030. Uh, therefore, the final goals we have together with EU. Of course, uh, we are not in the same line, in the same starting line as other countries. So we have to define some additional activities and uh, we uh, also have to perform specific goals, specific steps, specific activities in order to uh, reach together with other EU countries the goals which are set for uh, all EU. Therefore, we made the main highlights for smart society, smart economy, and smart government. And uh, of course, we uh, rely a lot and uh, correlate our activities with Lithuania progress plan and other important documents uh, as a national climate change management policy uh, plan of the integration of Lithuanian industry into European value chains and many others. Of course, uh, this roadmap, it's um, uh, part of the uh, National Lithuanian Circular Economy Action Plan. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, as I, I would like to stress that it's a part, uh, but it should go in co correlation with other activities and other uh, responsibilities uh, which are leaded by other ministries, not only uh, Lithuanian uh, Ministry of Economics and Innovation. So uh, what the kind of prerequisites for the formation of this circular uh, documents we have. So um, we have this uh, to um, have in mind this systematic approach because uh, of course you probably, and I believe you really know that circular uh, economy, it's not a responsibility of one company. It's a systematical implementation and it should be uh, collaboration with the Ministry of uh, Economics and Innovations, Environmental Ministry, Ministry of Economics, uh, education, uh, um, Science, Education and Sport, and other ministries which are, are responsible for the whole picture of uh, circular economy. Therefore, uh, we defined the main uh, priorities and uh, measures categories. And here we see that we have to concentrate on technical solutions, products, cooperation, and territorial uh, development in order to have efficient results. And of course, uh, we have defined um, some specific goals up to 2030 and uh, transformation uh, trend tendencies for this. And I um, go a little bit in more details. And this is the main goals which we have to achieve until 2050. This is climate neutrality, complete circularity, and of course, competitiveness, uh, which is uh, very important for Lithuanian industry because a in, um, high percentage Lithuanian industry is exporting industry. Therefore, we define the specific 
uh, 10 goals, uh, which we together have to reach until 2030. Uh, these are competitiveness, innovation, secondary raw materials market, collaboration, circular economy, function mechanism, material availability, infrastructure, business models, science and education, and sustainable consumption and the promotion of the change of the um, socioeconomic methods. And uh, for these um, uh, goals to achieve, we have this direction for change. And we divided these directions or defined this direction for change. Uh, there are six of them. So leadership uh, of the government, uh, and uh, we see that uh, in this um, uh, transformation of Lithuanian industry, the leadership of the Ministry of Economy should be taken. Of course, for the for the change, we need their uh, competences and uh, specific knowledge, and uh, of course, to perform, to change, to treat our um, waste, um, to to accept technologies. We need, of course, uh, proper regu regulatory environment. And all things should happen, of course, uh, with the financial support. Uh, from this technological point of view, in order to ensure circular economy, circularity implementation industry, we definitely need uh, related innovation and technologies. And ensure if we, we, if we are going to the right direction, uh, if we mm, defined and chose the proper methods, uh, we need the monitoring system uh, in, on uh, different levels, on uh, company level, on uh, country level, and together uh, in the synergy with uh, EU level as well. And now I will try shortly to discuss what is hidden um, behind these um, directions and uh, uh, introduce a little bit this action until 2030. So uh, we have uh, these uh, different um, objectives uh, related to the regulatory environment. So we have the um, to enable the effective operation of extended producer responsibility schemes, uh, which are the, uh, we are aware of great discussion also during the uh, um, roadmap development process. Also, uh, we have the very important activities to take uh, related to the green procurement. Of course, uh, to ensure the successful uh, implementation of uh, um, transformation of Lithuanian industry, we need to um, uh, establish the uh, platform for secondary raw materials and ensure functioning of related uh, um, activities and processes. Of course, and um, it's highly related with the regulatory environment for waste and products by encouraging our industry to adopt circular economy because we still, uh, as part of industry, we're still facing some, um, let's say, uh, uncertainty about what will uh, awaiting them uh, in the implementation of the circular economy concept into reality. And um, of course, if you go a little bit further, uh, what is related to uh, extended producer responsibility and circular industry, uh, we have um, uh, two, um, two areas for the transformation. So we have to evaluate the existing extended producer responsibility schemes in Lithuania and have to take into account the existing long-term problems and new challenges of a circular economy. Also, we have um, to evaluate the impact uh, according to our uh, priority or demo sectors and also uh, what uh, to um, evaluate the impact of the uh, imported um, uh, second-hand uh, goods into Lithuania and how it will impact uh, re, uh, reuse uh, processes, which are very important for um, Lithuanian uh, circularity uh, index. Of course, uh, in the green procurement, as I mentioned, it's also very important part ensuring the uh, circularity of Lithuanian industry. It's a uh, 
public authorities to become as a leaders uh, in the green procurement. And this green procurement uh, to, should became of great importance in their activities. And of course, um, there should be uh, incentive, incentive system to strengthen the role of the green procurement. Um, the another very important part, it's um, uh, related to secondary raw material market. And uh, we found, we heard this um, from the, our industry representative, how it's important to uh, enable, to encourage, uh, to increase the support for the modernization of renewal and the expansion of the technologies and infrastructure for recovery of these materials and resources, because it's a really important part of circular economy. Of course, it should be uh, uh, some certain investment uh, to uh, increase and improve the recycling capacity and, of course, the quality, the quality to get the higher value uh, materials uh, for the uh, uh, reuse and uh, um, processing. Uh, and uh, related um, uh, re regulatory framework improvement uh, should uh, ensure the expansion of market opportunities for secondary raw materials, uh, ensuring the competence and comp uh, competitiveness of Lithuanian industry in international market. Uh, of course, we have this uh, another area of the uh, hierarchy for the production based uh, industrial products and packaging. So we have some clear standards, legal frame frameworks, um, evaluation of the status quo for reuse, repair uh, and uh, reuse activities. Also uh, review the targets for material recovery. So how we can ensure that um, uh, we um, will be in the line of the EU regulation related to material recovery, not only transfer uh, to uh, energy. Uh, also, uh, we have to have proper support uh, to the investment in the infrastructure, uh, which uh, ensure the uh, proper amount uh, of um, recovered mate materials which can be used uh, in for Lithuanian uh, industry. And uh, uh, concerning uh, the development of technological renewal and innovation, we have two main goals. Uh, so um, we have to ensure a smooth transition of industry to circular economy. Uh, we have to ensure introduction of new circular innovation, new business models, and of course, sectoral uh, cooperation. And uh, another objective, the second one, uh, we have to ensure creation of high value added circular and sustainable knowledge intensive and self-organized uh, organized business models and job, of course. And um, uh, we are also have this transformation areas uh, prioritization and identification of opportunities. And there are uh, five areas for the transformation, which also uh, uh, very closely uh, relates to the, our demo sectors. And you see here uh, enumerated some specific uh, activities uh, which are related with our demo sectors here. Also, we have this, um, this second objective, uh, related to business models. So we have, we have to ensure developing the policies to support innovation and circular business models. Ensure that's very important and we have this separate objective to the knowledge and competence building, which uh, are needed to uh, develop this kind of uh, business models. And uh, we see uh, uh, that uh, knowledge and competences also one of the key parts uh, of the uh, circular roadmap, circular Lithuanian industry transformation to circular economy. And uh, uh, it should be started uh, in the very first stages uh, in order to support um, our Lithuanian industry and of, of course, all stakeholders with proper uh, knowledges, proper competences, and we have to agree on many 
things at the very beginning in order to have this uh, successful process uh, by 2030 and for certain by 20. 50. So here we have the rise of awareness of field of circular economy, uh, higher education and studies as a to see to treat higher education and studies as an accelerator of knowledge and competences of circular economy, and also uh, promotion of the implementation of circular economy, uh, circular innovation and technologies. Uh, by using good practices and, of course, sectoral competence development. And we have the very wide uh, involvement of different uh, consumers and stakeholders because uh, we define that uh, consumers uh, are the very important part of circular economy. And uh, because uh, in their hands, uh, there are end of life of many products and how they are treat, how they are, we are competent to uh, um, ensure that they are treated in a proper way. Uh, it's a very important part. Uh, therefore, we have many areas of transformation related to consumers and stakeholders in the field right here. And um, these transformations also are starting from the very beginning and continuously going up to 2050. Of course, uh, we have this uh, education in industry processes, so uh, preparedness of higher institutions to provide industry and stakeholders with um, high competent employees and also training, professional trainings and knowledges uh, which are needed to a successful implementation of circular economy and understanding the interdisciplinarity of the process and ensuring the creation of the synergies uh, between different sectors and uh, different stakeholders. Uh, of course, uh, it's uh, um, this vocational and special training uh, we see as a very important part for the starting point of circular economy uh, in industry and as well in ministries and on different levels. Therefore, this starting point right here, it should be ensured with the uh, high collaboration with uh, I see we see with um, a Ministry of Economics in Innovation and, of course, Ministry of Science, Education and Sport. And uh, another very important uh, part, it's uh, sustainable financing. Uh, we definitely see that for starting and for some support, uh, we need uh, uh, financing, uh, financing um, mm, sources for this. Therefore, we define here two objectives as a uh, appropriate sustainable orientation of investment towards uh, circularity and application of new fiscal policies and measures to, to shift the tax burden from labor to materials consumption and pollution. And uh, we see this as a crucial part to ensure continuous and successful development of circular economy. And uh, here I maybe uh, would like to pay uh, special attention to areas which we defined um, as a crucial to um, uh, uh, as efficient uh, performance of um, a circular economy. It's uh, uh, we need some basic research in the first part. Uh, uh, we mean up to 2030. So it's a basic research on the circular economy uh, and financing um, this part. Uh, this part is very important. Of course, uh, and the other parts as an ecolo ecological design and production for circular economy, increasing recycling and repair capacity, recovery of secondary raw materials for maximum value, and circular services. These are theoretical and basic part of circular economy. Uh, everywhere, but we should definitely define this um, proper financing uh, um, sources for these uh, uh, activities. Uh, of course, um, we have to ensure the uh, use of EU structural funds and uh, sustainable financial 
financing packaging opportunities. And here we have uh, to uh, encourage our uh, industrial companies collaborate with um, uh, research um, and academic institutions, of course, uh, to apply for uh, EU funding and also to ensure that um, different financing mechanisms are active and effective uh, on um, national uh, level. And um, uh, we definitely see green taxes as a great possibility also to foster uh, the transformation here. And here we uh, highlighted three uh, areas of the transformation, as you see. They are related uh, to the uh, fiscal incentives, uh, high levels of hierarchy and eco design in uh, all project uh, support programs, and uh, a new tax and uh, possibility to introduce the new uh, tax, um, uh, especially related to this for energy. And uh, the monitoring system is mainly it's kind of uh, ensuring um, and uh, testing if we are going in the right direction. Therefore, we have here the three objectives, uh, the measuring the potential of the implementation of circular economy measures in Lithuania. Uh, the second objective is um, um, identification of main failures of existing uh, circular economy measurement systems and criteria for economic performance measurement system and criteria uh, for circular economy performance evaluation system. And uh, of course, this is more uh, for our internal, let's say, use. But anyway, uh, we would like to stress that um, uh, all the uh, data, all the uh, indicators should be comparable with the indicators which are applied by EU because uh, Lithuania will be um, measured or um, compared with other uh, EU countries and a circularity index of Lithuania uh, should be uh, growing and this is the goal for our activities here and I think all activities of other stakeholders which will be and already are involved involvement in Lithuanian um, uh, circular economy system and plan that's uh, very important to have in mind. Uh, based on all our uh, work of our uh, results analysis, uh, the uh, action plan was development and uh, if we are going deeper to each transformation areas which were um, presented uh, uh, by me, uh, we uh, develop, we would, I would like to say that we together with all experts and also together in consultation with all stakeholders uh, develop the action plan, which includes 164 actions for, uh, for up to 2030. Uh, and some of them have this pro, um, activities up to 2050, uh, which uh, have to um, ensure uh, the efficient uh, transformation of Lithuanian industry to a circular economy. And uh, of course, the huge question and very important question uh, is where to start, how to start. Of course, um, it's very important to agree that this is uh, our joint uh, responsibility. It's not only one uh, ministry's responsibility and we have to work together, especially in the very beginning, to ensure the efficient start of this transformation. Of course, we have to, uh, to develop the policies designed to support innovation and a circular business model, which are um, the um, basis, I think, for the further activities uh, for industry transformation. And uh, of course, we have encouraged uh, um, changes in behavior of and educate our stakeholders and consumers. So shortly uh, like this, I believe that there are so many questions uh, from maybe your side in the written form or you can contact us uh, later. But uh, this is a very important start. 
It's uh, like a starting point for our joint work and for Lithuania industry to become more circular and to uh, enter uh, as an equal and a very competent partner in EU circularity system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janetta, and uh, big thanks to all the Lithuanian expert team for a very hard and intense work for putting together all the information and producing this important roadmap document that is very important to Lithuanian industry. We have a few minutes still, so maybe time for questions. And uh, is there, I'll already see one, ran, one hand raised. So, Alphonse, please. Hello, dear participants. Uh, concerning taxation and financial issues, three remarks. The first one, you propose that the uh, level of labor force taxation is too high and should be reduced. I am not sure and cannot agree because in Lithuania, high, more than average wages are tax, taxation level is much, much lower than in European average, two times, even three times when we talk about high wages. Uh, the second one, you, you talk about uh, environment taxes, it's okay. But it's time to talk about uh, particular, about what we are talking, general, blah, blah, blah. Now, we should to introduce CO2 tax in Lithuania as quick as possible, maybe starting from not high level, for example, 20, 25 euro per ton of CO2. And uh, it's a little bit strange consumption taxes. You, 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 you talk about uh, uh, taxes for, for petroleum, and uh, this is uh, the, 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 the particular plans in Lithuania to, to increase up to 500 euro per, per ton. Um, so, about, about what we talk, this is now a liberal that we should reduce the, the labor taxation, which is in Lithuania quite low level, less than average in Europe. Or we talk about general blah, 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 environment taxes which taxes should be introduced and when, because time is uh, running very quickly. Many countries in Europe, they have introduced or they plan to introduce in next year, this year, but not, not, not generally, but very particular, particularly what we talk. Plans, plans, plans. When? Which? Thank you. Well, thank you, Alphonse, for, for your opinion. And um, maybe, Janetta, you would like to, to reflect some of the points? Yes, I would like. Thank you very much, Alphonse, for your questions. Uh, I just want to highlight that I didn't mention any numbers in my presentation. Uh, and as I said, there is our action plan of 164 uh, activities foreseen and uh, presented to uh, our ministries. And there are um, timing and also approximate um, um, financing size needed for a, each activity defined. But as I said, it's uh, not a responsibility only one of, uh, of the ministries, Ministry of Econo Economics and Innovation. And I do believe that um, uh, taxes, which I mentioned, uh, mentioned by uh, Mr. Braz, as they also, uh, responsibility of uh, minis uh, other ministries. So it should be the what we are stressing that it should be uh, the nice dialogue and sure between ministry and it should be at the starting point of the uh, circular economy uh, implementation uh, in Lithuanian industry. So that's very important to agree and to start uh, next year from the very beginning or to start right now. Thank you, Janetta. Uh, we are running out of time and we should start uh, with the third part. And uh, the third part uh, is uh, the potential of green and circular economy, new possibilities and challenges for industries. And for this part, I invite uh, once again, uh, this part to moderate, I invite once again our project methodological expert, uh, Richard Harding. So Richard, please. Thank you, Simas. Uh, well, we have... Um... Uh, uh, an hour ahead of us for, for this uh, session. Um, we have three presenters uh, presenting uh, about the broader um, policy framework for circular economy. Um, 
uh, about uh, means of uh, financing the transition to circular economy, as well as uh, one presentation on a detailed circular economy perspective from a specific industrial sector, in this case, the, the plastic sector. So I'm going to invite the speakers to uh, speak one by one. Uh, I think that we have about, we should try and aim for about 15 minutes each uh, for the speaker, so we have a, a bit of time for discussion if that's possible. And I would encourage people to put questions into the chat uh, while we're going along, and we will uh, see if we get the time uh, to uh, pick up those questions. And if not in this session, maybe in, this, in the following panel discussion afterwards, we can uh, try and pick up uh, people's questions from the floor. So. Uh, I'll start off by inviting uh, Jordi Pascual from Circle Economy. Now, Circle Economy uh, is the organization from the Netherlands who performed our circularity analysis at the beginning of this project. Uh, so I'm very uh, happy to welcome Jordi back uh, among us uh, for this uh, presentation. Uh, Jordi, your presentation is about the necessity or conscious transformation of industries. Uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Richard. I'm gonna share my screen. Do you all see it? Yeah. Yes, perfect, brilliant. Thank you so much, Richard, and uh, very happy and pleased to be here today. And uh, also pleased to see many familiar faces, Sima, Evelina, Zanetta, obviously Richard. So uh, thank you for having me and super interesting to, to listen um, to, you know, what's, what's, what's happening now in Lithuania after we, we, we finished the analysis a, a few months ago. So uh, uh, very pleased to be here and to present uh, a bit of an inspirational and uh, reflective uh, presentation on uh, the trends in circular industrial uh, transformation, which is based on uh, our work on uh, the Circularity Gap uh, Report uh, Initiative. So currently, uh, we stand at a crucial, crucial crossroads, and material resource management is a, is at the centre of of the debate. Uh, as you can see in the slide, uh, in 2020, we crossed a significant milestone for humanity. Uh, for the first time, we consumed 100 billion tons of material resources per year globally, which is about two times the global boundary of 50 billion tons. At the same time, global carbon emissions continue to climb, and we saw that uh, COP26 with different reports being launched, such as the one of IPCC, causing the, the United Nations to issue the statement, a code red for humanity in the latest uh, emissions gap report. So we really find ourselves, as I said, at a crucial uh, crossroads at, as a civilization, as a society, as, as, an, as an economy. Do we continue the rate of linear consumption and most certainly uh, risk catastroph uh, catastrophic environmental and social risks by the end of the century, or rather we start shifting uh, to a different model of production and consumption uh, quickly enough to mitigate all the, the damage that, that has been caused in, in, in our society, economy and uh, environment. So, as you can see in the slide, in our circularity gap report in 2021, we explored what a global circular economy agenda could look like for climate and material consumption. And we built three different scenarios that led us to some, uh, some conclusions and results that are actually quite in line with a lot of the insights that come from other institutions. Because a global agenda packed with circular economy strategies has the potential to reduce global material consumption by 28% and emissions by 39% to keep us uh, below uh, the, the thresholds that uh, scientists uh, have set for, for our economy and the impact that it has in, in, in our environment. Because we cannot continue uh, producing and uh, operating 
in the business as usual. Because on this track, as you can see in the upper trend, uh, we are on track for 177 billion tons of material consumption and 80 gigatons of emissions by 2050. And that's said by the United Nations, a catastrophic outcome for, for humanity. And uh, in our work with the Security Gap Report, uh, and, and you can see Lithuania in, in, on, on, on the screen, uh, you know, to achieve the results of the circular economy scenario that I just mentioned in the previous slide, we would need to double the global security metric from the 8.6% globally that we measured a year ago to about 17% uh, level. And we have calculated then on a national level how are different countries doing in terms of circularity. And uh, most are well below the global average of 8.6%, as you can see uh, on the screen, such as Austria, uh, Norway, the Netherlands, Quebec, Lithuania, Croatia, just Austria and the Netherlands seem to be above uh, uh, that measurement. Uh, however, uh, many other countries, uh, and you can see Norway just being 2.4% or Croatia 2.7% need to really uh, improve. And it's not just about one country or the other, it's just uh, us all as, as an economy. Uh, Jordi, we're, we're not seeing the slide there. Oh, there we are. Okay, we got it. Right. Ah, okay. Great. And now, you know, to, to now, you know, see how can we, can, can we go about this transition? How, how can we change this picture? We need a large scale change and we are the, uh, to truly shift to a circular economy model. And this means redesigning how we produce and consume material goods. And now I, I want to present just three trends that from circular, circular economy, we really believe can make a big change uh, in our industries and our economies. And the first of them is uh, the energy transition. A key trend that we need to acknowledge uh, is, of course, the energy transition, as I said, and realizing a global and zero carbon energy system is a necessity, yet it has a lot of implications because we are rapidly moving from a gas and oil powered economy to an economy that is powered by mined materials. Uh, such as lithium, metals, alloys, etc. And this will have a lot of implications and it has different challenges. Uh, because on the one hand, in principle, we aim to avoid virgin material extraction, but we will need more extraction, extraction to fuel the transition and mitigate climate change. So these materials are also complete, uh, com will also compete with other uses. So the opportunity here is the materials that we extract will not be emitted as gas, but can remain in our economy thanks to the use of super economic practices. And there are a lot of innovations in this, in this field that we can really just make use of what's already available in our economy so that we can fuel the new renewables and, and the energy transition. And that example that I like, for instance, is the, the case of of the Puma project in, in Amsterdam, which is a project that basically researched the, the existence of three main metals in the city of Amsterdam, copper, iron, and aluminium, and created a geological map, which is called, we, they like to call it urban mining database, uh, where you know, this, that this allowed for more targeted and effective urban mining of precious uh, minerals and metals for the implementation of effective you know, policies and interventions such as you know, like using these uh, materials for uh, you know, the, the implementation of renewable uh, energy, for instance. So we really need to start thinking in this uh, direction. Another element that I think is it's crucial is the automation and digitalization of uh, our industries. Uh, this is a, glo a global mega trend that opens a huge op opportunity for, for design uh, principles, for instance. And there are a, a number of innovations here that I think uh, have a lot of potential towards the future. Uh, as, as it said here, uh, a lot of it, I think, comes with a parametric design and prefabricated uh, practices. This is very relevant, for instance, for the, the, uh, the construction sector. Then automation. For instance, in the waste management, 
Uh, there are a lot of, uh, of innovative uh, solutions also in Amsterdam, for instance, to separate organic waste, for instance, for, from plastics, uh, metals and other uh, uh, waste and resources. But also digitalization technologies such as BIM, BIM uh, combined with, for instance, Internet of Things. I think this gives a lot of, of enabling factors and, and, and technologies to really accelerate the change. And an example that I like uh, from uh, Stockholm in, in, in Sweden is uh, the prefabricated wood uh, apartment. It's a huge building which uh, was basically uh, constructed and prefabricated uh, off site. And all these structures were then uh, uh, built and assembled on site, which then this uh, enabled. Uh, a very effective and efficient way of constructing and uh, a very resource efficient uh, way of constructing, minimizing waste. And then finally, one of, of the big trends that I also see is design or even redesign. This is, uh, I think, circular economy policies are spreading as are speeding up uh, with greater alignment on EPR, right to repair, extended, extended uh, warranties, and the corporate sustainability reporting directive. And I think all these factors will give a huge push to industry, and we are already seeing a number of front runners in this space. Uh, we, when it comes to, for instance, modular or repairable or adaptable goods uh, for consumables, uh, but also for furniture and other type of materials. And circular design has a lot of opportunities for, for new business models. And one example that I really like that I'm sure that many of you are familiar with is Fairphone 4. Uh, this is a Dutch social corporation that uh, produces uh, smartphones. And this Fairphone, and uh, more specifically Fairphone 4, is the most advanced modular and repairable design, uh, design uh, uh, phone that ensures that you can use your device for as long as possible, which is one of the main uh, ideas of the circular economy. So it's a modular design uh, that prioritizes key components such as the battery and the display and makes this assembly possible for the user, for the client, with only a standard uh, screwdriver, the driver that, uh, that you can have in your, in, your, in your home. And the company makes it very easy and accessible for users to repair or replace the phone's components. And uh, I will leave it here because just to, to wrap it up, I, I think I just presented a few, a few key trends that we see for, 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 for the industry and also for the industry in Lithuania that are emerging. And uh, there are certainly more that, uh, that haven't been discussed today, but I, I would like to just, just leave maybe a final thought, which is, you know, if we think of the, of the COVID, uh, of the pandemic and how it has really influenced our in industries and, and trade structures and dynamics in the past two years, most countries have been hit very hard uh, by, by supply chain sh shortages. And we are just leaving that with the energy sector, but we, with also a lot of, of, different, of different sector. And there are a lot of risks uh, tied to these global value chains. So many governments are opening their eyes uh, to the fact that there is a trade-off between economic efficiency and resilience. And it might be cheap to depend on supply chains that are globalized. However, when it comes with risks and other costs, it might, worth, it might be worth to start looking at, at, at resilience as another very important variable. And the gradual decoupling uh, and, and shortening of, of the supply chains in favor of more localized uh, value change, I think is, is taking shape. And all of these trends uh, that I presented, grounded by a circular economy perspective, uh, seem to be consolidating very quickly. And, um, and yeah, as I said, I, I will leave it here. I hope it was uh, inspiring to, to all of you. And again, Thank you very much for, for having me uh, today. Thanks very much, Jordi. Um, uh, are there any questions for Jordi at this time? Do we have any, any in the chat? No, okay. Um, 
Any questions? No. Okay. Uh, well, I'm struck by the uh, by the big gap there is between uh, eight point six percent circularity and seventy percent circularity. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, shows the scale of the challenge that's in front of us. Um, let's move to the second speaker, uh, who is uh, Mr. Marco Mancini from the European Investment Bank, uh, and he is the responsive representative for the Baltic States and a circular economy expert. So, um, Marco, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Harding. So I will share my screen. Okay, can you see it? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, all good. So, uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. So, my name is Marco Francini. I'm the head of the AAB Group Office for the Baltic State. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I, I heard very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting discussion, and uh, I think we're really going the, let's say, right direction. I'm going to present very shortly what the EAB Group is. Uh, our activities in circular economies and some example of projects that, that we have financed in the in the last years. So we are the Bank of the EU. Our shareholders are the 27 member states. We issue AAA bonds in capital markets and we finance projects in four key areas that are environment, innovation, SMEs and infrastructure. The headquarter is located in Luxembourg. And we have opened the office for the Baltic State in 2020 uh, here and is located here in Vilnius. We are also the Climate Bank. Uh, we, have issues in, we have issued in 2007 the first green bond. At the, same, at the time it was called Climate Awareness Bond. As of today, we have the largest issuer of green bonds worldwide. Uh, last year, in the context of the uh, revision of our energy lending policies, our shareholder took an historic decision. We will stop financing projects based on fossil fuels. We will increase our, our lending to 50% of our activities by 2025. Last year was around 40%. And we're aligning all our activities to the Paris Agreement by the end of 2022. The project we finance must be technically, financially, and economically viable. This means that in addition to the, let's say, assessment of the bankability of the project, we need to ensure that all the projects are environmental and social uh, and socially friendly. And this and, the, and they're in line with EIB and environmental social standards. Now, why uh, secret economy is important for the EIB? Well, the Paris Agreement is clear and we the objective is to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to the industrial, industrial level by 2050. How can we reach this objective? Uh, well, secret economy is, is definitely uh, one of the six sustainable development goals that need to be fulfilled. And it's for us, this is an, an opportunity to increase our lending to climate action and environmental sustainability. Now, what, what can the EIB offer? Okay, our financing option comprise loans to public and private sector counterpart, guarantees to financial intermediary, no record finance, uh, PPP project finance, equity to funds, mainly with our daughter company, the European Investment Fund, and venture debt for innovative and fast growing companies. DIB is also providing technical advisories to improve the bankability of project, as well as to share knowledge on best practices. Now, one thing that we have this specifically for, uh, for secret economy is uh, the support to, to, to the municipality, because we believe it's crucial. Marco, Marco can I interrupt you? Are, are you yeah. able to, uh, the presentation, I think it's on presenter mode there. Is it possible to put it on the... the um, yes, the, sure. The, yeah, the, Slideshow. Uh, yes. Can you see it now? Well, it's yeah, but yeah, but it's in presenter mode. Uh, can you put it on the normal mode? Just a second. Okay. 
So like this is better <laughs> or not? No, no, no. Well, like reading, you want to sit like yeah, this? Yeah, that's it. That's the one. Yeah, that looks better. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, going back to uh, support to circular cities, basically we have uh, identified municipalities as uh, being crucial as there is a big potential both for uh, input but also for the output and uh, city administration can also catalyze investment and initiative to foster the transition to secure economy and i think it was also mentioned this in the previous uh, presentation so uh, in the last five years we have financed around 2.7 billion of projects in circular economy uh, with more than 100 projects spread in various sectors of the economies. So I believe in the last year we have uh, developed uh, uh, quite a substantial expertise in, in, the, in, this, um, in, in this topic in, diverse, in a variety of sectors. Of course, industry and services in mainly, I would say mainly manufacturing, but also Agriculture and bioeconomy is a big part of what we're doing. Of course, without forgetting uh, water and waste management that cover really the largest part of our, uh, of our portfolio. So now I'm going to give some example of projects with finance that could also give, let's say, an idea uh, of uh, which kind of project we have. So this project uh, basically it's called uh, um, Green Fiber International. It's a project that is, uh, is located in, in Romania. Basically, we have uh, supported the project investing in uh, capital expenditure uh, to foster the capacity to uh, collection of recyclable material, of recyclable material, in particular polyester staple fibers from poly and, uh, and actually the, pol the production uh, of polyester staple fibers from polyethylene terephthalate, okay? And then the third part is really recycling uh, electric and electronic equipment, okay? So this is basically, uh, uh, let's say, um, an investment that in, in a way recycle both plastic and metals that are redirected to uh, car manufacturing, cushion or hygiene product. So this, is, let's say, is a is a is an example, is a practical example that we have, that we have been financing in the past. Uh, okay, so this financing was backed by the European Fund for Strategic Investment, the so-called Juncker Plan, and of course another important part of uh, of this uh, that we that I think we should communicate to the overall audience is that we have created 280 full-time jobs. Okay, and it's also important to you know to uh, uh, that the message is. Uh, uh, in this transition, we are also able to, how to say, to create new jobs, not only to destroy, because we, we know that there will be a transition, but it creates also new jobs. And of course, saving 50,000 tons of waste per year, which, okay, it's, it's uh, of course, is a, good, um, is a good start, I would say. Now, another project that we are, is actually also very interesting, is called Eco Titanium. So Eco Titanium, basically, is the first European industrial plant to recycle and re remelt aviation grade scrap titanium metal and titanium alloys. Okay, so as of before the project, before we did, before the let's say the this project, all aviation grade European titanium scrap was exported to the United States. Okay, so now this facility now is actually in Europe. Okay, and um, and this also you know you can imagine also the the emission to transport all this scrap waste. So basically, th this project uh, is uh, closing a recycling loop. Okay, uh, basically making use of val valuable metal scrap from European manufacturing sources that are from the European market, and basically it it creates um, a circular economy, uh, a European circular economy cluster here that was not present before. Um, um, okay, uh, just a few words. Of course, this project is uh, 40, 48 million, it's located in France. It has created 60 highly qualified jobs in the region. And uh, um, overall, 
is uh, one, uh, I, I think that uh, this is also, uh, if we see the previous presentation, we're talking about uh, metals and titanium. Uh, this is really in the, let's say, in the, um, is going the, in the right way in terms of our, also our, what we were saying before regarding the, the supply chain of various materials that we might not have in, um, in Europe, okay? Uh, now I will go to the next uh, next example. So um, now uh, an important part is also SME, so small and medium ent enterprise. So how can we also help SMEs in the transition to uh, uh, secret economy? So uh, Delage London is a global vendor of uh, global vendor finance company. Okay, so basically this project consists in financing of SMEs with uh, uh, leasing, okay? Uh, this leasing, what does it mean? It means that uh, we have an asset that is uh, uh, reused, okay? Uh, it extends the, uh, the economic life of the asset. We have a better uh, utilization of the material. And at the, end of the, and, and at the end of this life, we have the material recovery. Okay, so this is an example of, for example, uh, uh, how you could, let's say, um, improve uh, the, um, the utilization of many material. And this we can do it through leasing. And this, of course, is another important, another important point here is uh, the involvement of SMEs in this, uh, in this, particular, uh, in this particular transaction. Okay, the next example is also a very interesting uh, company. It's called Orbital System. The, the company is a uh, Swedish company. Basically here, what, what is the technology about? So, so they've developed a technologies, a recycling technologies uh, for, for domestic application, where basically we have both water and energy savings, okay? What we are financing uh, uh, for this particular company with 50 million uh, venture debt is, the opportunity for the company to invest both in innovation, so RDI, we're talking about really the, uh, uh, the salaries of the researcher and the team that is actually, uh, let's say, uh, um, carrying out the, 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 the innovation activities, but at the same time, also capital in expenditure to, em to empower the, the company also for testing capabilities. Because uh, when we have a technology that's you know, is, uh, is being developed, then you also need uh, uh, to, to scale it up. And, and this is something that I believe is very important because of course we're talking about material and, uh, uh, but let's not forget about water. Water is, uh, <laughs> is also a very important uh, natural resource. Uh, and, um, and especially in some countries, we see how, how much water is, uh, uh, is important. And I believe we're, talk we're talking about hydrogen, so it's, Hydrogen will come to water. We need to also to, uh, uh, to to consider this resource uh, even more scarce than what is being um, what is being right now. So I'm going now to the to the next uh, to the next uh, example. So this uh, project is called Belfus. is an intermediate uh, inter intermediate loan. Uh, with a thematic component. So Belfius, so basically the AB is providing a loan to, to Belfius and to finance what? To finance project mainly with municipalities, okay? Uh, at the end, we're talking about more than uh, around 59 projects all over in Belgium that uh, would support investment uh, more related to urban development, uh, so renewable urban infrastructure, energy efficiency, renewable energy, but also water and solid waste scheme that will foster uh, will foster a secure economy. So this is, as you can see, this is a project that is carried out by by the public sector. Okay, so we can also support the public sector in this. And as I was said at the beginning, municipalities are also a crucial part of the economy that should be supported in uh, you know in um, transitioning to a more circular um, to a more circular economy now 
this is another example. Uh, uh, what have we done in, in the in the IB? In uh, we started doing this in uh, uh, three four years ago. We are updating this regularly. We have also done um, uh, a guide. A guide shows a little bit what is our strategy. Uh, what have we done in the past? What are the new policies? We were mentioning before how policies are important, but at the same time also uh, how practically we want to support this uh, transition and how we can support the, uh, the um, let's say, the, not only the, the public sector, but also the private sector in transition towards secure economy. And this document is, uh, is publicly available. You can go into our website and download it. We've also done different studies in the past related to the access to finance to secure economy, uh, what I was mentioning before, also uh, uh, supporting municipality in this. So this is really in a nutshell uh, uh, what the IB can offer in terms of support to secure economy. I keep it short in order to leave the floor to any question and of course uh, this is my email. If you have, want to have more inf information regarding EIB support on this, I would be really happy to, to provide to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco, um, for that. Uh, very interesting, all of those examples. Um, I like the, uh, the circular leasing one in particular because it seemed to me to be supporting a, a, a uh, a real change in the ownership model in, in the business sector, um, which is yeah one of these system changes that we need to be thinking about very carefully. Does anybody have any questions at this, at this stage uh, for Marco of EIB financing? Uh, Alfonsas, I see you have a, uh, you have a hand up, yeah. go ahead. Uh, could could uh, present uh, shortly introduce the possibilities of cooperation European Investment Bank and European Strategic Strategic Inve Investment Fund. But for us, it's very important European Strategic Investment Fund and, and and partnership with European Investment Bank for large scale projects more than fifty million. Could mm -hmm. could 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 br briefly introduce the situation partnership. Can, can I maybe sure. add? A, can I add a question as well, maybe at the same time, which is just a, a, maybe a little more general, but it's it's just how do how do businesses come into contact with the EI this EIB funding? Do do they apply to the EIB, or is it is it like coming through different channels? What's the actual interface between this funding and businesses? Maybe it's kind of the same question. So thank you very much both for, for this question. So um, regarding EIB, yes, definitely what I can tell you is that, uh, um, um, I mean, you can send me an email and we can try to see which kind of product, which kind of service we can propose, both advisory or lending, okay? So basically the EIB is mainly doing, doing mainly loans, loans or guarantees. So we need to understand who would be the borrower, okay? Because at the end of the day, it's a loan, and and we need to understand who will be the borrower for that. Okay, the borrower can be a municipality, like municipality of Vilnius. It can be the state treasury. It can be a corporate. For example, uh, you might know that in Lithuania, uh, Ignitis is, is our uh, is our client. Uh, we have a municipal company that our client. Like uh, this year, we signed the first deal in the water sector with Vilnius Water. And how do they reach us? Well, they drop an email to me or drop an email to the you know the normal info at eib.org and then we try to see which product is available now regarding the european fund for strategic investment this was done in the previous programming period uh, in, in cooperation with the european commission okay uh, the, the the previous program period is now ended we we hope that uh, next year actually next year uh, uh, we should be able to deploy the InvestEU, that is the new program that has been done in cooperation with the European Commission. We are now at the last detail of the of the negotiation, but we hope that end of Q1, beginning of Q2, we'll be able to deploy InvestEU. Okay. And another thing I want, maybe I, 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 I'm going to mention is, is the following, is that... Uh, 
So uh, if you are, let's say, an SME, okay, uh, uh, then you might uh, receive, uh, okay, if you have an SME and, and, and uh, let's say the liquidity that you need is small, so let's say uh, uh, below a million, below 5 million, below 7.5 million, then the support from EB might be intermediated. So you might go to one of our intermediaries, for example, this year, uh, we have supported, uh, we supported in Vega, we have supported various financial institutions. Uh, you might have heard that uh, this Monday we signed five transactions, uh, guaranteed transactions between the F and financial intermediaries. So if, if the company is too small, then, okay, anyway, I would redirect them to a various financial intermediary with whom we work. But if you're talking about bigger projects, so project above 40, 50 million, then we could do actually a direct lending. And uh, another thing that I would like to mention is that the IB provides loans up to 50% of the investment cost. So for instance, if we have a project of 40, 50 million, the IB can give 20, 25 million. Exceptionally, we could go in some particular cases to 75% of the investment cost. But generally for a direct operation, we don't go below 20, 20 million loan. So it's a uh, rather big. All the rest, we would try to do it intermediated with financial team that are locally uh, present. I don't know if this has answered the, the question. But anyway, you, you have now email, you can contact me in, in private whenever you want uh, in, the, let's say in the next period. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Marco, for those, for those precisions. Um, let's move on to the next speaker, who is Mr. Remigius uh, Mialaskas. Uh, who is the CEO of R and R Industries? So, in the plastic sector, um, Regmigius, go ahead. Well, hello, everybody. Do you hear me? Yep. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you here. Uh, lots of interesting ideas and, and uh, opinions are here. The well, I'll try to share my presentation. Just a second. It is happening, why it is not working. Oh, it was working. <laughs> Would you like our technical support for, to take over your presentation? Yes, please. <laughs> Sorry, technical issues. Are you able to give us a few words without the presentation? Should get get us. Started. Oh yes, I can. I can. I can. I can start a little bit. Yes, I'm from the uh, our company R and R Ideas. We are in the plastics. Yes, and I was thinking about all this what was said before in advance, and I think that you know this circular economy, um, plastic industry is running at the at the front of the line, yes, of the circular economy, and it was, it, it got the first impact on, on circularity, yes, everyone, uh, once we talk about the plastics, uh, then we talk about what has to be done, yes, is the circularity, and in general, plastic industry is running very well, I should say, but uh, this, this, at the very end uh, of of this of this run, we have uh, the threat of survival. Yes, in general, plastic industry is under the threat, and this is the big engine for running. Yes, and so for good running, uh, we are in we are in business for polystyrene, and we are a cycler of polystyrene. Uh, our our we are in the place where, where the plastic and plastic waste ends and the new product begins. Yes, this is, that is an interesting thing that uh, we are at the, at the spike 
Yes. We see the industry, one industry that is coming to the waste that is coming to us. We see one side of this circular, circular industry. And on the other side, we see the industry that is using our raw material and how it is changing, how it is rapidly changing. And every year we can see uh, big steps forward about the about the circularity sometimes it seems crazy ideas but at the final end they are getting into life and we see we see really big improvements in this what has happened with this presentation i don't know but i really need it <laughs> guess uh, they are on the way because it's really a heavy one yes, you know <laughs> it's a heavy know. one <laughs> yes that's, this, uh, that's it is <laughs> And as, as I said, yes, uh, okay, where are we? This is the second one, the second page. Uh, please, next one. Second, oops, that one, yes. We are in polystyrene. Yes, the polystyrene in general and the plastics, is, it, it is a small part of the plastics, but it is very nice to, to it, you, we can see very nicely on this industry how it is happening in all the plastics, yes? With uh, polystyrene, we have very small parts in different industries. Most of us, most of the plastic is in packaging and building construction. Uh, we, we have a little bit in electronics, householders, and et cetera, but general in packaging. We can concentrate on the industry and to see exactly what is happening with the with the plastic, and we can we can trace it very easily. This can be the this can be the how to say on this is how we can compare with other plastics. Uh, please next one. <laughs> yes, the polystyrene. Uh, can easily be recycled. Yes, this is this is not a new thing, and it can be easily recycled to the same products, and it can be also easily recycled to the uh, upstream or downstream products. Yes, so for us it is not difficult to make a products that are total totally looks different, but in general it is the same formula under it, and. As we go further with the industry, it is getting uh, more technology and more pure material we can get. Uh, please, next one. Uh, what is, who are we? R&R &R ideas, yes. Uh, in these past 10 years, we hear lots of, lots of questions, how to recycle polystyrene and who is recycling polystyrene? Till today we have the idea, till today we have heard that somebody is talking that polystyrene and lithuania is not recycled. Uh, I'm here to tell you that polystyrene in lithuania is recycled like 10 years. It started 10 years ago. And we are doing pretty well with polystyrene recycling in lithuania. One thing that is uh, very important to us, uh, like professors and Janetta from KTU told, that we are connected with European because we are exporter and importer. So with Europe, with Europe plastic circularity, we, we are combined. We are the part of it. We cannot be circular here locally because economy uh, of recycling and plastics is bigger than Lithuania itself, yes? We, we understand it, that we make it here, we have the regulation, but in general, economy of this plastics is bigger. And we, we say that we are European player. Yes, locally, we are making and improving collecting of loose EPS, expandable polystyrene. That is a, a small part, but I will show it in the next, in the next slide. Uh, what we do, we are collecting, yes, this is polystyrene, this loose EPS. Next, please. 
collecting in different shapes and forms and different packages, no matter what, we can recycle it. As I said to you, polystyrene is easy to recycle and we're doing it. Next, please. Uh, then we are sorting and densifying the, the material in order to, to get the, the right product, the quality product. Uh, next, please. And this is our product, yes. We exporting the resin, the granules that could be used for different types of products. Next, please. And this is how we do it. 2020, we made uh, more than 5,000 tons. Five and a half thousand tons of material was recycled here locally in Konas. In general, we, 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 we say that our next competitor recycled about maybe five to 10,000 tons, yes. And it happened maybe in Poland and in Germany. Uh, we accumulated and we, we picked up locally, locally, 233 tons. It is only 4% of all our production capacity, but we did it here locally in Lithuania. Next, please. You can see how we were growing. It is like 30% every year loose polystyrene collection increased. Uh, this for 2021, I guess we have 260 tons. And if you, come, if you can imagine how, how big this is, how, how much it has to be done, one ton equals one truck. So it means came in one place, in one company during the year, there arrived loose material, light EPS that you have in packaging from, from TVs, from washing machines, from, uh, from cups, from everything. It's loose material, like you see in the background here, 233 trucks arrived here, were unloaded, compacted and recycled. And this came only from Lithuania. We have the target for the next year to increase once again in 30% to improve it. We need help from the collecting system, from, from, the, from the cities, from the municipalities to combine it. Uh, we need help for improving the culture of the collection and improving culture of collection in personal and in companies also. And not only in companies that are collecting, but in companies in general, all the companies. Next, please. What is good about polystyrene? <coughs> Polystyrene is, uh, is not blended material. It can be very poor material. P purity is very high. So it can be changed, as I said to you, from, from one material, from one production to another, pro from one product to another product. Uh, polystyrene has uh, sortability. It is easy to sort, but NIR automatic system for sorting. Today, we have different ways of recycling of our material. We're using mechanical recycling. Yes, and mechanical recycling is improving. And today we can do it up to, it, it can be done already for the food approval. You can see that it was tested and was done. And some companies, European companies already have the technology it need to be just improved and run in life. Mm, what, is, what is other issue with the, with the plastics that happened in, in the long run, at the beginning, at the front of circular economy, that companies, plastic companies, they don't get enough raw material. Uh, today we produce 5,000 tons per year, if we can get more, we can make more. We cannot take, we have the issue to get raw material, to get waste, to get the certain quality waste to our production. Today in Klaipeda, Pak Klaipeda can use 
is using 1,400 tons per year. It is 30% of their capacity only is recycled. And they say, we can do 100. We don't get 100. Yes. So actually, industry itself is ready to take more and to use more. Market is too narrow at the moment for giving us the material. Next, please. Yes, this is the task what European EPS uh, Association has made for the 2025. And I believe it can be done. Yes. Next, please. And this is the team that believes. This is our team. We believe that someday all the polystyrene will be recycled. And someday we will not imagine a, a life like today, it is difficult to imagine our life without internet. Someday, we will not imagine our life that, that, that plastic is not recycled. This is not possible. Yes. That someone is somewhere going to the landfill. Someday, it will be unbelievable thing. And it is nearby. It is coming. And this is it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attention. Thank you very much, Remedius, for that. That was that was very interesting. Uh, can I ask, do people have questions for Remedius at this at this point? I, mean, I I pick up then that this very clear message that that in fact, I mean, you have the capacity. Um, that's not the problem. Your problem is getting enough enough of the of the waste. That's that's amazing. So. Um, there's a there's a real gap there which should be filled simply by behavioral change um, yes. quite soon um, but you know why I, I have to take the opportunity because while I'm I have the floor here I like to think I'm an enthusiastic enthusiastic recycler and I I try and put all of the plastic that I that I have uh, into the plastic uh, bin but I get people telling me, oh no, we can't recycle this kind of plastic. We can't do that kind of plastic. And I think, well, what, what, am, I, what am I gonna do? Am I just, do I carry on putting it in the recycling bin or should I put it in the landfill bin? What should I do? You should, you should put it in the recycle bin. Of course, no, don't, Richard, don't do it. Don't put it on, on the landfill. Yes, it should be recycled. The, we, we see the problem that the, the waste, the plastic, uh, this, this is some kind of learning of companies, le learning for the investment has to be done, of course, in the quality, in the economy. But what, what is the, what's of this? If you have the production, if you have super quality, you can take super low quality raw material to make to make it to food approval quality, yes, to recycle it, and super nice products to make. But you don't have the you don't you don't take it from the landfill, and everybody why why plastic is so why plastic is so so um, have so many attention yes because it is everywhere we see it everywhere and it is it is strange that you don't know what to what to do with it. Yes, this is the gap where we have to work, where it has to be made investment, to have, it has to be resources put over there, uh, and people have to understand that it is recyclable, what is recyclable, what is not recyclable, and the day has to come that everything is recyclable. It has to be recycled. This is the fact. Yes, nothing should be nothing unrecycled. Okay. But, but why are why are certain plastics not recycled? I, I, that's the thing, or not recycled. People say they're not recyclable. That's that I still sometimes, don't understand. Sometimes people just don't know. Yes, lots of people till now in Lithuania think that EPS is not recycled. Yes, uh, we are recycler. We have to we have to give a message. Yes, mm -hmm. but uh, we give a message to. To some to collect in company, yes, please collect the EPS. And we still get the message back EPS is not recycled. It is easy to tell that it's not recycled. 
it is easy for human to tell that it isn't cannot be done. It it can be done, yes, in harder or or easier way, but it it is done. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's a very clear message. Uh, and I think that it takes us, if there are no more questions, uh, it takes us into the next um, session. Uh, we've, we've a little slightly ahead of time. How would anybody like a, a short comfort break for until, uh, until 10 past? When I say that, I'm saying I would like a short comfort break. <laughs> <laughs> To start again at ten past, so the timing that's on the agenda. How about that? Yeah, I think minutes. we should go ahead with this. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Okay, five five minutes, everybody.
Okay. Okay, are we ready to start? Yep, let's begin the next uh, session. So what we would like to do now is a panel discussion um, uh, about how can industry lead to the green and circular, the green and circular economic transition. Uh, and what we're going to do is we will have the three speakers from the previous session uh, joined by three more. Um, so we have uh, Mr. Ricardas uh, Valenchauskas, who is head of uh, innovation and industry department in the Ministry of Economy and Innovation. Uh, and Ricardas has been helping us uh, very much with the leadership of this uh, particular project. Uh, we have Mr. Visvaldas Varchinskas, uh, who is an expert working at the Kaunas Technological University, and um, Visvaldas has been uh, a, a great member of the expert team uh, working on the roadmap. And uh, also uh, Mr. Mantas Vilis, who is director of uh, the Lithuanian Innovation Center and the Lithuania CERN Industrial Liaison Officer. So I invite you all to join this uh, discussion. I uh, have a question, I will start asking uh, questions, but as before, um, uh, anybody from the floor who would like to ask a question, please do so in the chat and, uh, and we will see if we, can, uh, if we can pick up those questions. So I start uh, with a question for, uh, Ricardas Valenchauskas. Uh, Ricardas, are you are you there? Yes, I'm there. Good afternoon, oh. Richard. Good afternoon, all Hi. the participants. Hi. Hi, Ricardas. Nice to hear you. Uh, uh, so uh, after everything that we've heard so far, I mean, in general, what do you think? I mean, does Lithuanian industry have a choice now about going circular? Um, and, and how urgent does it seem from your point of view and from, from the ministry's point of view? Well, I think, uh, and I believe industry has no choice actually, but to go circular and green in general. So, and, and actually for various reasons. First of all, just uh, to be able to, to stay in the game from the perspective of competitiveness for, from the survival uh, aspect. So starting with resources. So the recent crisis showed that access to resources is very limited uh, and, and supply chains have been disrupted and dependence on raw materials and energy resources, well, it has a very different, a very big impact on the general uh, economic activities. And, and in this respect, circularity may definitely help. Uh, again, continuing with resources, uh, well, having uh, used you know, the principles of circularity, we can lower the production costs in the longer term by reusing the same materials, uh, by reusing the same products. Uh, actually, new business models may emerge uh, by, by using new approaches on, on businesses, on, on the usage of recyclable resources and so on. Uh, another thing is, of course, it's not only the, the competitiveness just to stay in the game, but also to create a new added value, to create new products, to create new benefits, uh, new features of the products which may be more appealing for the consumers in general, or uh, consumers may in general buy new products uh, based on cir circular models because, uh, well, they, are, they have raised their awareness uh, on the impact on the on environment, on the economy in general. So it, again, it pushes, it will push the businesses and industry to become circular in the very soon time. And following with the consumers, I think we also need to stress that we will need to work not only with the industries, with the businesses, but also with them, with the society at large, to ensure the education and training of, of the consumers to inform them about different consumption options and push them towards circular behavior. And finally, of course, the role of the government, so it can be both positive and negative, so for various sanctions or through various uh, stimulation uh, stuff. So this is actually a more general discussion when we talk about the Green Deal, about our uh, aim to, 
to reach the uh, climate neutrality by 2050. So is it driving us because of the environmental approach or due to economic reasons or could it be combined? So of course, from our ministry's point of view, so definitely we see a lot of potential in creating new added value by creating new instruments and initiatives to encourage industry to develop new products so using raw materials, reusing actually uh, previous uh, products. And, and I believe that of course it will take time for our industries to, to change their approach, but it will come sooner rather than later and we will have it in place in Lithuania quite soon as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, that's that idea of the time, you know, it will take time for, to make this change. That's the, that's the thing where I'm wondering, you know, do we have that? Do we have much time? Uh, that, that's uh, um, probably one of the key points. Uh, Jordi Pasquale from, from Circular Economy, what's, what's your feeling on this? No, I mean, I, I very much agree with Ricardas. Um, I mean, the, I, I like this perspective on stay in the game. Uh, that's a very good point. Um, and I, I believe the question also asks about the urgency of the matter. And I think in November at COP26, it was made extremely explicit uh, uh, the extent of the urgency we, we are all in. So I, I really believe that the fact that Lithuania started this process well ahead of, of COP26 really shows that there is there's a willingness and uh, uh, by industries, but also the, the, the politicians and the public sector to really start this transition and, and really focus on a, on a green and circular industrial transition, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, because as I said in my presentation, we need to double circularity by, by two, so reach 70% circularity globally. And I think, uh, the work that we did in the past year really showed that uh, Lithuania is is ready. Uh, I think it, it does have the ingredients, uh, the capacity and the innovation and knowledge to, to do so. So so I believe just reflecting a bit on, on some of the recommendations and insights that came out of our analysis and then that the, the Lithuanian experts took into, into the roadmap, I, I really believe that uh, you know, a fit for purpose regulatory, regulatory framework, as well as also, as I think it's, it's been mentioned, leveraging uh, fiscal incentives, uh, technology, and also innovation to increase resource efficiency of, of different industries. And also, as Ricardas was saying, strengthening competitiveness of, of the key industrial sectors in Lithuania. And uh, I also think that for an effective industrial transition towards a circular economy in, in, in Lithuania, the measure should be, you know, encouraging, encouraging collaboration and industrial symbiosis and, and, and implementing, uh, you know, policies such as green taxation, uh, for example, coupled with the creation of, of stronger market pool for circular goods. So uh, uh, high, an increase in the circular goods offer which will then, you know, also um, drive demand, which combined with, for instance, circular procurement and the expansion of EPRs, that this can really, you know, strengthen and make, you know, the circular economy market in Lithuania uh, way more stronger and, and really help uh, industries in, in Lithuania to, yeah, to embrace the opportunities of the circular economy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you, Jordi. Uh, maybe ask, I turn to uh, Mantas Vilis um, uh, at this point. Um, we've been hearing from the EIB about, uh, about um, different ways of, uh, of supporting businesses to become more circular. Um, what's your view as part of uh, uh, Lithuania Innovation Centre um, about how best can companies be supported? And, and actually maybe from my point of view, more important than that in some ways, how is the best way to actually approach uh, companies to, to make sure that the take up of support is, is most successful? I hope you hear me well. Um, yeah. Thank you for the question. 
I'll try to blend my answer also with the with the, with the previous panelist um, kind of statements that I fully agree on and uh, to kind of extend um, uh, extend this view on on you know Lithuanian business uh, fabric and so on. Uh, definitely, I clearly see that pr probably majority of the Lithuanian companies, smaller and bigger ones, they are really well connected into these global value chains, and they clearly kind of see this opportunity that the circularity is bringing, and uh, that it's not a surprise for majority of the companies that they see the potential in this, and they respond basically to these opportunities and challenges and so on, and then thinking about you know how to best. To how, the, uh, how to trigger this bigger change within the companies and, uh, and in the industry and the means to do that, I clearly see that the best way to approach is that um, uh, is to kind of to respect the two types of um, companies that basically are in every country, not only in Lithuania. There are definitely definitely the companies that uh, that uh, that um, Incre implements the incremental changes to their activities. The, the followers, basically, they are well connected. They talk to the suppliers, they talk to the customers globally, and they clearly see the patterns. But one way or another, they are just still the followers. Yeah? And um, yeah, they understand the material efficiency issues. They, they talk a lot, uh, and then they clearly prioritize some the, the energy efficiency, less polluting productions, and so on. But basically, what they can do about that, they understand their core business, and they say that, yes, mm -hmm, yeah, we follow this, and we could do something about that by implementing, by adopting some technologies, by using the best practices from, I don't know, our suppliers, partners, customers, and so on. So they basically respond. And this is the particular big group of Lithuanian um, companies that are the followers. And uh, when we are talking with them, you know, what is needed to make this change, even though it's incremental, but still a change in this towards the circularity agenda, they clearly see that, yes, we need some support in finding them uh, the, 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 the technologies, the solutions that are relevant to us because we are flooded by different voices around the globe on this is the emerging thing, this is the thing to implement. And so, so for them, coping with this um, uh, asymmetry of information, assessing um, to which extent it is impactful for their business, uh, how to make the investment priorities, where to invest first in, com in, in terms of um, the circular um, uh, economy kind of opportunities and so on. So these incremental steps and the discussion that we can have with these companies in helping them out in uh, not only in a search, but also in making the decisions where, how and when to adopt, definitely uh, is the way to follow and the way to, to proceed uh, trying to mobilize this big domain of the Lithuanian companies. And uh, when it comes to measures, what actually makes them uh, do the incremental changes faster, maybe um, not to postpone this, but to do that now. So they need de definitely the soft support, but also some incremental small measures, financial measures, being it a tax incentive, being it um, um, uh, a technology adoption um, uh, subsidies and so on, definitely brings the message for, for the companies and definitely they are mobilized and they understand um, uh, you know, that the change is now, but not later. But another cru crucial thing that are a crucial um, batch of the SMEs, the companies and the industrial companies that I would like to highlight and not to forget the promising drivers of this change, the radical innovators, the developers of the global, maybe hopefully global, um, you know, um, uh, game changing, um, let's say solutions, uh, broadly speaking. So these are the, the pioneers and totally a different world when you talk with these guys, um, the means to support, the means to mobilize their radical kind of developments is of different nature uh, when, it, when it comes to the public support, public intervention and so on. They are operating this batch of the companies, they operate in a totally different world, a very risky uh, environment. And the higher is the risk, the more risk mitigating measures they need. And for that, they clearly see that yes, uh, <laughs> subsidies, grants, uh, research to business collaboration initiatives, platforms, uh, a heavier investment opportunities we need, definitely we need in order to make it not only for the Lithuanian uh, purposes, but for the global level um, 
kind of um, circularity agenda, important decisions. And uh, I still uh, believe that yeah, we have to find, uh, talking about the Lithuania, we have to find the balance between, on one hand, um, uh, supporting the pioneers that could be the game changers for the for, for the global scale, but also working with the uh, with the industries with the majority that by the incremental changes could have the cumulative effect towards them, uh, towards the uh, towards the digital uh, digital uh, circular transformation and so and when it comes to the you know how the industrial companies uh, could be approached for them um, you know uh, uh, they they understand the, the challenges in front of their business and the better the policies then just the suggestions the grants the the services uh, the better they are related to their realities the better they understand this and for that I, I kind of think that maybe we don't have to distinguish them you know circular kind of um, transformation support versus any other support that is for business so it's kind of i believe that it should be embedded by default to all you know business support infrastructure <laughs> we don't have to put you know that it's, it's this is the regular um, the business support um, the facilities services grants in lithuania and this is something for circular and i believe that the biggest effect and the even even from the company's perspective, you know, they don't want the advisor that comes uh, to their uh, premises to, to discuss, I don't know, digital transformation leaves and then someone for the circular economy uh, transformation comes. For them, it's still the same kind of, um, uh, you know, evolutionary steps that they have to take, the government that supports them, for sure, and in many means. And uh, this, my, in my belief, that it should be embedded in a regular kind of innovation, business support um, uh kind of service package uh, by default and then again the following question what are the the the, the, the most effective support measures that's a, a big pandora um, a box that if you open and you try to understand you know, what is actually works best and uh, to which extent and so on uh i i kind of maintain my my main message that i repeat everywhere that um, not only the financial incentives could make a change i believe strongly that you know there should be some sort of the blend on one hand helping out to navigate um, uh, um, uh, to advise the companies in this messy environment that they are facing the digital uh, circular um, any other emerging trends that affect their businesses so someone who has to be there for them uh, helping to navigate to uh, independently impartially make the decisions uh, discuss the options and then they make uh, to make the investment priorities and later on the financial measures and subsidies and uh, tax incentives definitely kick in in order to to um, to push the companies to start now and not to postpone so uh, having the balanced, in a nutshell, having the balanced um, focus on pioneers that could drive the circular technological revolution and the ones that could be following and adopting, and um, finding the blend of financial versus um, advisory kind of support uh, for the change. I would strongly believe that this would make a change possible in a rather near future. And, and do we have such pioneers in in Lithuania that 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 can already be used uh, or can 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 help with the, the drive forward? That is, uh, except for uh, Remigius, who we already have. But uh, even uh, we can invite the Remigius to the discussion as well uh, here. But on one hand, uh, you know, uh, he's um, uh, a good example, a showcase uh, how the technology is put in practice, hmm, you know, in addressing it. But uh, who is in a, in a driving seat for developing these technologies further on? I mean, uh, in this global value chain of policy. I mean, uh, now, yes, we uh, collect, we kind of pre fabricate and condense, but what is happening next? Um, you know, can we do some uh, more or higher added value products out of it instantly here? Who is who is building this technology? Or someone is building and we are searching for that and we will bring it to Lithuania. I mean, uh, the next steps and is it the best um, or the biggest value chain uh, already created here? Or there are some areas uh, to expand this, um, you know, uh, because I sometimes I also feel um, that uh, you know this uh, chaotic kind of development of innovation is also really really unpredictable. Because imagine that a new packaging material is developed that would revolutionize and change everything, and there is no packaging uh, left to recycle. There, there is something else that is built. 
with the purpose on on um, you know to um, to reuse and recycle be more circular and so on some technologies are emerging and no polystyrene will be used at all so that means a big trouble for <laughs> for that business even though we're pushing forward the boundaries of you know circular evolution that means that this business would be affected uh, dramatically or might be i mean you should be part of the game it means that not only the follower not only the user of the technology but you know you should be on an equal basis uh, on what is happening now and for me the, the it is curious uh, super curious you know how how let me just see this evolution of the sector uh, you know uh, who is building the technologies now for the future are we part of it uh, to which extent we're part of it how do we see the role uh, you know, the, the new ideas and new technologies are not coming out of the blue, yes? Some, someone someday has to be started and has to be done, yes? Mm. Out of the blue, if we, we take some, something, yes, okay, if we just picking up, the, picking up only the stars from the sky, then we, then we can say, yes, this is, this is very nice and we but it is very small technology and something very small that can be improved and we will be everyone is happy yes i agree with you in two ways that there are followers and there are starters the the kickers of 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 the of the technology and of the circularity whatever but it doesn't come you you don't wake up one morning and you are not becoming as uh, a, a, a star for a new technology you are doing something, you are improving something. Uh, you are, okay, you, first you have to be the follower and then you have to combine it with, the, with, with, this, with this new technology inventor, yes? Uh, when, when we say what is that has to be done, yes, a lot of things are done in here also. And you are right about the packaging and now the packaging is fighting. I said in my uh, presentation, that plastic is first that got the hit for the circularity. And every, because you can have it, it is everyday life. You have the, I have here plastic cup on, the, on my table and you have it everywhere. And you see it and you see it as the waste. And he got the first hit in the market and the circularity and everyone is running. Plastic is running very well about the circularity, yes? We get a new ideas, but we don't know how, how they will go further. In the, in the plastic, we have ideas, we have recycling, and we know how it will be in the next 10 years. So we are like followers, but also we are improving like, like, like best technologies and, and new inventions, yes. Yes, we are not making, Lithuania is not making technology for, I don't know, for micro, molecular or whatever, yes. But we, we, need, we need some, you know, we need some, we have people, we have clever people, we have very nice, smart people. We need uh, some financing, some, uh, some ideas to come together like here to discuss and to go further, yes, to go on it. Uh, plastic got the hit, plastic got the fight now about the packaging. Yes, I agree with you, but no one of you would like, last, on the COVID yes, situation, all the plastic industry increased. Yes, so we, we cannot find the change for the plastic industry products in the certain situation with the COVID and this was uh, impossible to change, yes. Everyone is picking something today. I go for, for the kitchenette and I will get the bread with the plastic Yes, plastic packaging and, and everything is, is filled in, in plastic, yes. So during the COVID, plastic industry increased. Circularity also increased, yes. I don't have the figures right now, but I, I know that companies in Lithuania, okay. I see that there was the comment on what are the examples and that um, uh, your example definitely kicks in here. I can, I can also reflect a bit on other examples. I mean, uh, I, I always, every day, I'm surprised by the ingenuity and the creative powers that, you know, are in Lithuanian businesses. And I mean, there are a number, number of, of course, very early stage developers of the technologies and solutions that might change many things. 
the one that pops up in my head, for instance, um, uh, that is not, you know, typically considered as the technology developers, the sector like a diary is uh, a milk uh, uh, producers, whatever. <laughs> and uh, I do remember the long discussion that we, we have had. All of them, they face the same things. They have some leftovers, some, uh, some, uh, some uh, things to get rid of it. I mean, uh, being the producer. And then for them, the natural thing was, you know, what should we do about that? Yes, we can dispose, but maybe we can, you know, uh, think of something of value out of these um, leftovers. And, you know, efficient use of every resource for them was a starting point. And then they, uh, uh, we tried to bring them together with some scientists. And then the scientific kind of project uh, was born on how to uh, convert the, the, the residues and the leftovers from the milk processing process into some uh, chemicals, uh, not chemicals, but in some substance that are actually similar to the plastic example that we have had, that you can sell into the global markets as being um, a raw material for some other production and so on. And suddenly this um, uh, milk factories became um, a chemical factory, not chemical, but some sort of the producers of raw materials. And for them, it's totally different business kind of model. They say, mm, shouldn't we do some spin-off out of it? Uh, I mean, uh, not the core business. And then, you know, suddenly the, the not not the adoption of the technology that they adopted from somewhere. No, they built some solution that basically solves many issues with some regular in mill processing processes and leftovers. So that an example, of course, then for them is to scale this technology to all global um, mill processing factories is that a big challenge. I mean, it's their, not their business. They solve their their issues now, they are happy with it, they get the big, big, bigger profits, so they don't have the leftovers, residues, and so on. That's good, but you know, how to, uh, you know, how to make this um, global kind of trend, uh, and then definitely different types of support is needed for the, um, for the export, not export, for building the global partnerships, for building new business, it's a new business model uh, for making the materials from um, waste. Uh, an example, and, and there are a number of it that are at the early stage, at some stage, and, you know, I super um, uh, wish that they, some of these would be the pioneers and, um, you know, some, some, sometimes we talk about the unicorns in terms of um, growth and, uh, and uh, revenues and so on, but sometimes, uh, you know, uh, more radical technologies that could be brought from Lithuania with love to the global scale, that's the wishful kind of thinking that I'm um, uh, elaborating now. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'd like to maybe I'd like to turn to Fisvaldas uh, Vashinskas uh, just with a question about the whether this idea of supporting companies or whether do you do you see that there's a di distinctly different kind of support should be delivered for different kinds of companies or different sizes of companies or, and in particular in this whole story do you, what's the specific role of the larger companies compared to the uh, SMEs? Hello, I hope you can hear me well. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for such a, a super expiring and involving discussion, which is happening right here now. So I'm, I'm really enjoying to participate. And, you know, uh, in the question regarding the impact or importance of transformation towards the circular economy and including the support need for different sectors could be discussed in several angles. First of all, the first question is the challenges, opportunities of circular economy is equally relevant for all industrial sectors. Um, and definitely maybe the answer is no. There are sectors with bigger possibilities and um, the previously European Commission in European Union Circular Economy Action Plan already um, defined uh, several key product value chains with the biggest potential for implementations of circular economy measures. These value chains and or sectors are electronics and ACT, batteries, vehicles, uh, uh, packaging, and plastic, which are the front runners, textiles, construction, and building food, water, and nutrients. And similar sectors uh, were identified as illustrative sectors in the Lithuanian roadmap as well. And the section of and selection of these sectors is very much related with a, a wide lifespan of products with a big load of available materials for energy, for looping in life cycles of, of, of the products in, in, in mentioned sectors. 
and also growing awareness and awareness rising among consumers of these products. Uh, highlighting of these sectors, I guess it's it's widely agreed fact. But um, the next question is, uh, is the selection of sectors is the only one key uh, to evaluate or create industrial potential in circularity? Uh, or the size of companies decides, defines potential or, or, or success to be circular. And um, in this point, I would not agree on that. Uh, I would like to stress more on regional approach. It is quite clear that it is difficult to measure and we tried to, 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 to measure circularity in, 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 in a national or macro uh, level. Uh, the Lithuanian circularity rate, the Lithuanian circularity index, and it's difficult to do it without uh, looking more deeply what is happening in regional or urban level. A potential of industrial symbiosis, which was speaking about the uh, possibility to close loops of different materials or energy between different industries or business players, depends on many factors, and geographical is one of the most important, I think. It is quite uh, clearly stated in um, European Union's Urban Agenda 21 agreement that regional or urban dimension is critical in success of implementation circularity model, models in our uh, real lives. Regions and cities are ecosystems with uh, quite clearly identifiable industrial uh, additions, existing uh, materials and energy flows with regionally organized waste management systems, with locally established industrial companies, and the, the most important, with the citizens, which are the potential field for growth of new circular business models or incentives in small and medium business level. And uh, a roadmap, roadmap of transform, transformation of Lithuanian industry toward the circular economy in the roadmap, we mentioned the need to establish monitoring system and start collecting data regionally in meso level in order to get uh, a more clear view on what criteria our national circularity rate is built and where is the real potential for improvement. And it's quite clear that um, we will not manage the circularity without measuring it. And we need to do it in macro national, meso regional, and micro company level. We have examples like, like we had previously. And uh, what uh, your uh, second part of your question, Richard, was about uh, what is the role of larger companies in transformation towards the circular economy? Uh, definitely the answer is to prepare for time when the huge pressure uh, for changes is going to happen. And actually, I think that it's happening already now. Uh, new strict legal requirements lack and rising prices of resources and energy, uh, collapse of long-range global supply chains, uh, pressure from consumers, and rising new competitive business models with innovative, dynamic, and consumer-friendly sustainable solutions or services. These are the main drivers which will determine why, uh, whether or not industrial companies will be able to adopt themselves and survive in competitiveness fight. And um, finally, the last idea that unfortunately we have no plan B and no more alternatives uh, on this planet, including industry, which is the part of planet is. So maybe these are my thoughts for your question. Okay, Griswaldas, thank you very much as always. Uh, we got a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, we'd like to turn to, uh, we have, um, uh, Maria Calvo, uh, I, I think, is somehow questioning, you know, whether whether there are really very many of these uh, pioneers in Lithuania, but uh, but asks a question which uh, is maybe more fundamental: Are, are companies actually uh, aware of uh, of the need for change? I mean, even after all of the work that we've done in the preparation of this roadmap. Uh, is there still a real awareness gap uh, in the industrial sector about the need for a circular economy transformation and how to go about it? Um, and we have a, uh, another question from Alfonsas, 
which is about the extraction of critical materials. Are there plans or capabilities in Lithuania for the extraction of, uh, of critical materials? And I'll throw this open to the, uh, the, the, the people on the, on the uh, part of the panel. Uh, who would like to answer one or other of those questions? I may take the first one, I guess, okay. um, of course, during the preparation of, 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 of Lithuanian roadmap, we had uh, quite a lot of discussions with Lithuanian industry companies in, in different uh, sectors. And definitely the, the, the pressure and the achievements in, in, in circular economy incentives is, is different in different sectors. Uh, uh, packaging and plastics, they are under the strong uh, legal pressure. Uh, so legal requirements and regulation came first for their sectors. And we, we saw a lot of already different implemented technologies and solutions, how companies are trying just to survive. And this is the, the, the case of, it's not about the competitiveness or a bigger profit. It's the questions, are, this, are they going to survive or not? Taking into account other sectors, of course, that... Uh, uh, I, I, would, I would highlight the, 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 the packaging and plastics. Uh, we don't have much electronics batteries or, batteries or vehicles. And of course, there is a movement of, uh, in the textile sector more uh, driven by the price of, 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 of waste uh, treatment and especially uh, the uh, um, pressure from the consumers, the rising awareness from the consumers because the fashion is going down these years and even the most expensive fashion is requiring for sustainability. And um, yeah, so, so these are ideas. And uh, actually, uh, we have a lot of examples of uh, different uh, solutions, technologies, or decisions which are made in order to achieve circularity in material uh, or energy consumption inside the value chain of the product. And these are usually not labeled as circularity because circularity is not the target. Circularity is not a function. You are not selling the circular product because it's not labeled. Circularity is a tool to achieve efficiency, to save your amount of materials, to find a cheaper source of, 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 of materials, to save energy, to shorten the supply chain, to get to 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 to, to uh, handle the value of material in the end of life of your product and so on, and it really um, becomes the benefit for the company and and the company benefits out of it, and sometimes we don't have the very um, how how we say the, the the shining labels about circularity, but these measures are implemented and and the pressure and we have four 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 types of pressure legal requirements. Uh, costs and competitiveness regarding the, the, the price. Uh, then we have the, the, the supply chains, availability of materials, including the critical materials, and then uh, consumer pressure, rising awareness, awareness of consumers and pressure from the market. So these are the drivers. Okay. Thank you very much. That was that was very useful. Anybody able to tackle the uh, the Alfonso's question about critical materials, the, the list of thirty critical materials at EU level, uh, and and whether whether in Lithuania there are there is the ability to recover this from waste? Yeah, I, okay. I can try shortly answer because well, yeah, it's a very good question, of course. This is a good suggestion, and we all agree that it will it would require a lot of uh, different uh, kind of investment and a large cooperation of Lithuania, starting with the government, also going towards uh, science, science institutions and businesses uh, at, at the end. Because well, uh, there are of course uh, opportunities in Lithuania to have these kind of, of materials. Uh, we have knowledge about potential. Uh, potential elements uh, in some places of Lithuania and south of Lithuania of some metals and so on. But of course, it will, it would, it would require a lot of financial investment and uh, again, the cooperation. So this is a good suggestion. I think I will, we will also discuss internally how we could, you know, move with this one in the, uh, in the future, because, well, 
this would definitely help for Lithuania to have its own resources in Lithuania and without thinking of how to import some of the most critical ones into Lithuania. I want to comment here. Uh, now, everybody, imagine 10 years ago, yes, we, we're talking now about certain materials that are not, uh, that are critical raw materials, yes. I can tell about myself, and this is also comment a little bit for Mantas by Ulysses idea, yes. This is how these kickers, kickstarters begins, yes. 10 years ago, I was just solving the problem of one of the material that is unrecyclable. Nobody wanted to take it. Nobody wanted to recycle it. And everybody knows it. And everybody closes the eyes of it. Yes. And this is how it started. I just, I just was trying to find a way how to do it. I was following and I was inventing. Something I was inventing, something I was, I was following. I guess that for 30 of the materials, maybe maybe other, other size of the, it depends on the material, other size of industry, other size of capacity, other size of funding or investing, but the, but the sketch, the draft will be the same, yes? To look for what is done, to find the inventors, find the, find the, the guys that believe in this idea and to find some finances and it will be solved. Of course, it has to be in the schedule. It has to be on the table, that it has to be done. If there are 30 materials, all of them has to be done. Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. I have been just looking at the clock and I see that we are uh, three minutes over, over time. So I believe because we have a short lunch break, we should stop it there. Um, I mean, that was a very rich discussion. I, I couldn't possibly sum all of that up in the time uh, that we've got available but, but i do take away a couple of things uh, one is you know circularity is not the ultimate aim it's actually a tool uh, i also uh, took away the uh, crucial need for a uh, uh, circular behavior uh, right throughout the system uh, and um, uh, the particular thing which i think leads us into this afternoon is i like the idea expressed very much about um uh, support for businesses, not, you know, no separate circular economy support. It should be built in to the general support for businesses. That also seems like a great, uh, a great suggestion as we move forward. Um, but let's stop it there for the moment. Uh, we start again at uh, 20 past one. So there is a short uh, lunch break now until 20 past one. Okay. Yes, thank you, Richard and the panelists. Yeah, we meet soon and now it's a lunch break. Have a great lunch then. You too, thank you. Okay.
Tai laba diena, gerbimi kolegos, pereinam į lietuvių kalbą. Hello, dear colleagues, we shift over to Lithuanian language. And I would like to start the second afternoon a session of our international conference. And before starting our second part, I would like to note that uh, this is one of the most important events uh, within the ministry, one of the most uh, significant projects uh, in the history of the ministry. And I think that everything started from the creation of the platform uh, industry zero, uh, 4.0. And today we have a very important roadmap now that we are going to follow in the long run uh, for the future uh, prospects. So this is a good starting point to, for the Ministry of Economy Innovations to undertake leadership. And I think that we have uh, done the first uh, work, the first job, and I would like to express my satisfaction with the fact that we have a logotype of the roadmap, uh, which uh, we created in collaboration with the Vilnius Design and Technologies College, which um, provides meaningness, meaning to our work. And so, I would like uh, to get over to the agenda of today. And in it, we will have three presentations uh, to be delivered by the Ministry of Finance, uh, Irma Patapiene, Investment Department representative. She will uh, submit a presentation about uh, transformation of secularity and uh, financial support. Uh, provision and about the actions, then we will uh, go to uh, the Minister of Economics and Innovations, Innovation and Industry Director Richard Valenchauskas, who will present uh, uh, the actions uh, to implement our roadmap. And uh, our session will be finished uh, by Thomas Garolis, uh, Lithuanian Industrialist Confederation representative. Uh, by providing a presentation about the secularity, or whether it is a race, or is it just going round in a circle. So thank you uh, a lot. And so Irma, the floor is yours. Please start. Uh, good day. Thanks uh, for the possibility, for the invitation to talk in this uh, beautiful event. And organizers uh, are promised uh, to share my slides with all of you. As it has been mentioned, I come from the Ministry of Finance Investment Department, and in my short presentation, I will do my best to answer a question of how we are going to fund the secular transformation. Is there money for that, and how much? And so, please change the slide. It is quite strange, quite odd, that my presentation speaks about funds, about money. Uh, and I wanted to start it by reminding that back in 2019, the European Commission uh, recommendations, uh, in which Commission told very clearly which types of actions have to be undertaken and what has to be done in order that circular economy is boosted. And uh, based on those recommendations, it is clear that not only money, alone is important and now the most important thing is that in order to encourage that secular economy you know changes have to be implemented actions have to be undertaken both by financial institutions by the banks by the uh, politicians and the implementers of the project and so we understand very well that that uh, attitude to the secular economy has to be horizontal integrated and that in order to achieve this, everybody's involvement is needed. So please, next slide. Uh, to which extent Lithuania has uh, foreseen funds in order to achieve goals by 2030? September 2020, Lithuania approved the national progress, progress plan, national PP plan, and uh, what indicators that we want to improve. 
And as you see from this uh, presentation, quite big challenges are waiting us while improving innovation index uh, and productivity, productivity of resources, uh, and so on and so forth. And so improvement of all those indices will require uh, many interventions, the regulatory actions and their change. And of them, we see that these goals, these indicators are related to the secular economy and maybe not so much directly, this is not a direct indicator, uh, looking at which we could assess where we are in our secularity. But we understand very well that uh, improving these indicators we will accomplish uh, a lot for the benefit of the secular economy, because these actions are closely interrelated. And there are uh, some indicators concerning, you know, landfills and how household waste will reduce and how repeated uh, consumption will have to increase and also recycling of household waste. These indicators are more specific as you see. And the National Progress Plan, of course, we have impact macro indicators and next uh, concerning the objectives, we have more specific indicators of the results of our outcomes and I'm going to mention them a little bit later. So next slide, please. Uh, how much money do we have for these uh, uh, goals uh, and indicators? So by 2030, Lithuania uh, predicts uh, to 17 billion euros uh, to all areas and progress in all the areas, in all the fields. Majority of that money is composed of different EU money. Cohesion policy is important. I have in mind 2021 2027 an investment program, which is coordinated with the Commission, and uh, uh, the last stage will be soon approved. Another one of the bigger funds and instruments is economic recovery and resilience uh, um, enlargement uh, plan. We call it the new generation Lithuanian plan. A huge money, 2.2 billion euros. Also the fund of the fear restructuring and uh, all other instruments and funds. And of course, we uh, add our Lithuanian state funding uh, uh, and we have another amount uh, of our state budget, which will be not as a contribution to the EU project, but just uh, money intended for new progress projects for the development of the country, uh, for new projects uh, and funding of new objects. Uh, next, we can get over to another slide because this EU cohesion policy uh, comprises the biggest part of the money, one of the most important documents, of course, 2021-27 uh, investment program uh, in which we have planned what we are going to do. And when the Commission uh, uh, is going to support this investment program, only after that this will become a law. So far we are following, you know, uh, coordinated uh, documentary project. And so the European Commission and the uh, recommendations of the Council, Council recommendation says very, very specifically to direct investments to the uh, green cause, to the green restructuring and to encourage technological innovation. So that line is very conspicuous and we feel that through negotiations during them and therefore in the second priority of our investment program, we have an objective encouraging transition to a secular economy and effective use of the resources. So we, over there, we have foreseen activities. Uh, these are uh, environmental uh, Ministry of Environment activities uh, with 100 million euros and with national co-funding that would make up around 130 million euros. Uh, and what are these activities uh, for household? Uh, uh, collective uh, uh, collection, sorting collection, in order to encourage it also to process uh, the waste and for the capacities of uh, uh, recycling. And uh, they receive uh, 50 million each. And the third activity, which is second in the list, but I left it for the end, 
it uh, receives about 7 million euros. So in that activity, the Ministry uh, of uh, uh, the Environment will implement communication campaigns, both for households, both for trade, services, companies, uh, enterprises, for the entire society, of how saving resources uh, uh, it is possible to sort them with how not to waste food, etc., etc. So uh, these are going to be broad communication campaigns, uh, which we understand are uh, very important. And concerning our investment measures, we also have a duty uh, from the point of view of the European Commission, not only because we have a certain requirement and commitment, we and ourselves understand that in order investments are implemented purposefully in a targeted way, in a measured, coordinated way, we need to have plans, documents, analysis in order uh, those investments uh, are achieved effectively so that we achieve our objectives. So, so there is a requirement that each country, including Lithuania, must have an updated waste management plan. And so concerning the plan of the circular economy, there is no any such duty. It is very necessary, but it is not one of the documents which would be an obligatory condition without which uh, we wouldn't be able uh, to start using the money. So while well, getting over to another slide, I just wanted to show you the types of activities uh, by investment program are uh, uh, going to be implemented by the Ministry of Economy and Innovations. Maybe Rivers of Solichalskas will speak broader. I will just briefly tell you that below you see some reason the color changed to the gray color. So so we see all enumerated priorities and amounts of money, eight priorities. And at the end of the right side, we have a fund of the fair restructuring. It will be actually included and supplemented by the investment program when it will be described and programmed to the end. So the work is still ongoing and the activities that we could attribute as contributing to the secular economy is in the first priority, more progressive Lithuania, and for this priority, about 1.3 uh, billion euros is uh, allocated. And what are the activities in it? Uh, uh, on top left, uh, we uh, show you the investments to industrial restructuring, to the automation of uh, industrial processes, and implementation of digital technologies. And then the second priority, which is called and more green Lithuania, greener Lithuania in this priority. Ministry of Economics and Innovation uh, has activities intended to industry energy uh, consumption efficiency, encouragement of that efficiency, and usage and implementation of renewable energy resources. So we can go next. Yeah, we submit you a general picture of how our investments look like. Uh, for 2014, 2020, what we did, what we accomplished, and how much we fund. So this is the upper line, upper part of this slide, and also others, other uh, financing funds and instruments uh, which uh, will finance either directly circular economy or industry and business in those areas which are very greatly related. Uh, to the secular economy. And while speaking about uh, existing measures that we are still implementing, uh, so we will uh, finish 2014-2020 measures until the end of 2023, which is uh, uh, the measures of the Ministry of Economy and Investment, the most known, like Eco Consultant, Eco Innovations, LT, Eco Innovations, uh, LT Plus, uh, through which business together with its own Money had already invested it, yeah, quite a lot of, uh, of money. Uh, this is uh, uh, also a contribution of the business and in the waste sector, uh, measures of the environmental ministry, so European Union together with municipalities, private companies invested already or are still investing uh, by 2023, 123 million. And while speaking about uh, new money, new instruments and measures uh, for 2021-27. Uh, as I showed you earlier in our investment uh, program in the list of priorities, uh, uh, 
there are measures of the Ministry for Industry around 500 million euros of them, 300 EU money, and about 200 will come from the private companies, their contribution. And for the waste handling, the waste management, uh, where I mentioned about 100 million social activities. So we see that 100 million plus national contribution uh, from the state budget, all in all, about 126 million euros. And the fund of the fair restructuring will have activities which are relevant uh, in terms of uh, uh, our discussion, decarbonization of industry and creation of sustainable jobs. Another source uh, that is uh, depicted uh, lower is the uh, modernization fund. Uh, quite recently, it has been decided and approved that this area will get 40 million euros. I'm not sure how this activity is uh, precisely called, but we just see that this measure has been allocated for industry and where funding conditions are still being described uh, in the process. And uh, it should really contribute uh, to uh, the uh, goals of this area. And also a plan of the new generation, Lithuania, 2.6 billion euros, and here we distinguish such activities which would contribute more to the secularity, like startups, support to innovative startups, and also greening, greening. And there is another industry lab uh, measure for industrial enterprises. So I believe that the Ministry of Economics and Innovations will comment in more detail about plans and the implementation. So we could get over to another slide, because uh, I wanted to, to talk separately about uh, this uh, new generation uh, Lithuanian plan. Since uh, we all look at it, are looking at it, uh, it is a specific instrument, uh, Lithuania of new generation, intended for reforms. And how and why is it important for the secular economy? Uh, by the fact that in this uh, new generation Lithuanian plan, the recovery resilience instrument uh, foresaw a reform towards the secular economy. And here we committed ourselves to draft the action plan of the secular economy. And of course, uh, this uh, plan uh, of Lithuania of new generation has not only investment measures that are funded, uh, but also many obligations, commitments as to which documents have to be designed, which legal acts have to be changed, because this is a reformative instrument. And we're speaking about investments themselves. So any separate dimension that we could open and look at how much is intended in this plan for secular economy is absent. However, uh, it is important to know that of 2.2, uh, billion euros, 500 million, one fourth of all the funds of the plan go to business. So we deem, we think that uh, through this funding to business, we will uh, contribute uh, to the goals of the secular economy. And returning back uh, to the secular economy actions plan, uh, I could ask why is it important to us? We see that absence of that plan uh, was one of the more important gaps uh, uh, in terms of the European Commission, investment uh, program, etc. Since uh, uh, we would be short quite often of the justification, substantiation and specificity of actions so that we could submit uh, for the Commission uh, uh, our vision and to defend those investments that we wish to implement. So we understand that in this field, the field of secular economy, where things are so um, intertwined, economical and environmental, that such a document which would, uh, in a coordinate way with uh, uh, position or actions, uh, you know, is uh, very badly needed. And 
And so far, we hadn't had any such plan, but measures that I mentioned, we do have good examples. Uh, uh, I wanted to show them for you, at least some of them, of those good examples. Uh, for example, through the measures of the Ministry of the Environment, uh, 16 uh, stations, uh, uh, tank stations were constructed in which, you know, uh, waste, uh, large waste is being collected and uh, they are shared uh, and uh, continue their life cycles. So it's really great that we have the stations and they are quite widely known already and popular in the society. Another uh, beautiful example is the establishment of the Alitus Region Waste Management Center where uh, the waste collection uh, station uh, was uh, created, uh, so a repeated uh, usage is being encouraged. And here, uh, this really complies with our wishes to use resources in a more saving way. And at the same time, it's a, a big encouragement and support for those people who are short of the things and who experience different accidents and misfortunes. And such initiatives are really helpful for them because they are supportive of their fires, etc. And of course, there are many projects of the private uh, enterprises funded by the Ministry of Economics and Innovation. So all information about them is public, and uh, we provide information for public, uh, and we are announcing summaries uh, and reviews on our uh, website. We just wanted to show here for you that there are quite many projects uh, in which uh, entities uh, change their production methods, uh, they use uh, resources in a more saving way, in a more sparing way, and they give up uh, uh, harmful substances. Here I wanted to come back uh, uh, to the uh, way of using the plant funds in the National Progress Plan and our strategic long-term document. How do they come, where do they go up to the projects, up to that real funding phase? I have mentioned already the National Progress Plan, which is the first stage uh, establishment of strategic goals that we have passed over. And now we are in the stage, which is the uh, development of the uh, development program or designing of the development program. The Ministry of the Environment is uh, doing this job in the third stage uh, uh, is uh, the measure of the progress. And the fourth stage, uh, based on the uh, progress measures, uh, uh, calls will be announced or planned projects will be funded. That means that then there will appear uh, progress measures and possibilities to apply, to submit applications. But in this funding period, we call those applications a project implementation plan, the same as an application, so that uh, we are still using new concepts and try to explain them to people. And then next, uh, how the designing or the working out, drafting of those programs uh, is taking place and what would be our uh, comments, proposals for the Ministry of the Environment together with the Ministry of Economics and the Investment. So in the National PP, uh, Ministry of Economics and Innovation is responsible for 1.4 objective and it is intended to, to reorientate industry towards climate neutral economy. And uh, this uh, uh, objective, we have indicators of what this objective means. And when we look at indicators, things become clear. Because uh, here uh, uh, we have to use the money purposefully. So we will uh, seek to improve the circularity index, also to improve ecological innovation index. We will reduce uh, uh, gas, waste gas, but in the industry, we will try to save more energy in the industrial sector and we will reduce the pollution, the emissions of harmful substances also from the industrial sector. So here we foresaw 206 million euros and if we add the modernization fund, so all in all, we will have two 
146 million euro. And the Ministry of Economics and Innovations uh, is planning actions in this year of how it is going to implement this uh, objective together with the Ministry of Environment, other institutions, and the Ministry of the Environment is really a very active secondary, uh, second ministry. And the Ministry of the Environment on the right side, as you see, is implementing 6.10. 6 objective and this objective is intended to reduce the quantity of the uh, generated waste and uh, to uh, handle to manage them effectively and under it uh, specific uh, indices uh, have been established so household waste reductions uh, per inhabitant and also reduction of the quantities of the waste in the landfills and also the quantity of the household waste and its part must become bigger. I'm not enumerating the sizes, numbers, percentage, which are very well known. I just in general try to show you what we are striving for. And also we try to reduce the generated waste. So the Minister of the Environment within this objective has around 87 million euros around that. And uh, what is uh, our vision? How do we see uh, all of that? It seems to me that a general integrated picture is very important because one ministry has one objective, one task, the other, the other. And it's important that it doesn't happen uh, in the way that interventions are non-balanced, not coordinated, or even worse, when there is some area or problem which is, uh, which would remain lost, so to say, or not covered. So indeed, how does the work uh, go? So based on each objective, the ministry uh, raises questions uh, about the problems uh, in this area and the causes uh, to those problems. So when uh, we have a development program, we have to understand the problems very well and their causes, their reasons. Therefore, it is very important that not a single cause to those problems is missed, is ignored. Next slide, please. So when ministries uh, will have agreed uh, very clearly uh, based on the priorities uh, on the problems, in addressing the subjectives and on the causes to those problems, then the ministry will be drafting the measure of progress, the progress measure. And what is it, that progress measure in this period? How do we understand it? And maybe it differs a little bit from our usual understanding. There are some changes. So progress measures are understood as complex interventions because the progress measure will have to be composed not only of investment activities, but of regulatory, analytical, and communication, uh, publicizing activities. So that principle of how we are drafting the measures, and we understand they are very uh, suitable for the secular economy, uh, according to that horizontal and integrated approach that we need. And the strategic management methodology uh, sets out uh, the key goal of that measure and what has to be achieved. So simply speaking, the ministry while drafting a measure must ensure that um, set problems are addressed in the most effective way according to the funds available and the indicators raised. The most effective result has to be achieved. So uh, indicators achieved and best contribution to the achievement of the uh, objectives set. I'm finishing my presentation. How to do that? How to achieve that that measure is most beneficial, most useful, knowing all problems and challenges, uh, tasks, objectives, indicators that have been set. Uh, for that, uh, we have uh, put together a mechanism and tools how to achieve that. So first of all, cost and benefit analysis. We, in the description of the measure, uh, we have a certain tool, a calculator, which helps ministries 
to put together those costs, expenses, and to conclude and accept the most effective set of activities. So I know that the Ministry of Economics and Innovations is now forming a working group, a special task force, and has started the work, starting quite effectively with the drafting of the measure. And what are the principles that are applied to ensure success of this process? Uh, group work or teamwork, uh, as uh, offered in our rules, and also the key principles such as partnership, openness, involvement, engagement, transparency, so that all information must be announced, publicized uh, on the ministry's website, which is very clearly written in the rules themselves, and uh, the most necessary preconditions uh, in order that uh, progress measures are drafted uh, 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 and uh, in a quality way. And uh, such events like this, in which we discuss openly and everybody is uh, invited, economic uh, partners, uh, uh, interested institutions, uh, really contribute to the involvement factor. And we believe will uh, contribute to the, uh, the quality preparation of the circular economy plan. So this is my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, dear Irma. Thank you very much for your bird's eye view. And uh, so we'll uh, get into more details in our next presentation of what we offer for the industry. Because uh, that uh, general picture is, uh, you know, a package intended for business. So we'll more concentrate uh, on industry. Several things that I would like to generalize and I will get over to questions because we have two questions. In your presentation, you asked, uh, shall we uh, achieve synergy? It is not possible not to achieve. This is cannot be an, avoided. Our cooperation with the Ministry of the Environment is overlapping. If we don't achieve synergy, there will be no results. We must do that. Uh, this is the key strategic aim of ours. And uh, waste management is that field uh, which doesn't belong to the Ministry of Economy, but we perhaps uh, we have foreseen that the division uh, also in this period, so we'll really uh, find common points together. And now I will get over to questions again. I see Alphonse Brazos has a question. Please ask the question. I will not read it. Hello once again. Uh, having listened to you, I have an impression that for those 7 billion uh, public money, uh, Lithuanian economy for the coming 10 years uh, will be developed by uh, uh, the government. So the government, the government in power will develop economy. But I understand that private sector will be doing that in general, not only private, but in general business. And uh, if business is a repaying thing, uh, so quite cheap credits should be available, should be made available, whereas now they are not easily available, in particular for SMEs. So as far as I know, in, the, in that uh, RF program, there's a possibility for 3 billion euros uh, to borrow from uh, solidary uh, European Union money and different bonds, green economy bonds, etc. But Lithuania is not going to borrow cheap. And then through respective structures, through state development bank, which we haven't done not yet, or consolidated uh, and uh, small and big agencies. Uh, or one agency like in Latvia, Altum and Estonia Credits to fund the business, to credit, while creating competition for private banks, which do not rush to credit. So concerning credit, I heard zero, but I heard about 7 billion euros of a present for everything, state institutions, services and private business over the period of 10 years. 
this is a fearful thing. I'm really concerned. So over two years old, that assistance was not clear. Rich people received three billion and they put them to the banks in their deposits because uh, poor people spent all that money and two billions uh, uh, were given to business and uh, business put that money to deposits again so business after 10 years will have five millions and people also five billions this is a critical approach of mine because it turned out that everything is done by the government in this way, not by business and not by initiatives i'm sorry for saying that could I respond? I understood that I made a certain mistake, that I didn't show how much we plan to implement of the financial measures, loans, guarantees, risk venture, risk capital. Uh, we are implementing such measures already now, and of those 17 billion, yes, part will go through financial tools, instruments, money returns back, then used again, and then um, possibilities to accomplish more increase and speaking about and you mentioned the autumn example yes i could provide you a separate presentation uh, in, to show the goals of the government a governmental program uh, because uh, there is a, a, a consolidation to fi finance uh, uh, business and the works are ongoing and uh, when consolidating uh, the funds and when they become stronger and when the capitals of the companies increase we expect the possibilities to borrow and work actively on the market will also increase we do have such uh, aims uh, for the new consolidated establishment or institution thank you very much thank you Alphonsus, for your question and thanks irma for your reflections we have another question from our participants. A question is such that uh, there is a measure 2.6 uh, encourage uh, transition to the circular economy while encouraging uh, more effective use of uh, resources in order, and also prevention of the waste generation. The question is as follows. All funding is intended to fight uh, waste management and where is prevention where is the efficiency of the use of the resources irma could you comment please yes uh, uh, this question is understandable and at least part of the measures of the ministry of the environment yes i intended for the fight with the consequences or against consequences therefore i said that there must be a complex of measures both for prevention and also for the handling of their consequences. Both types of measures are needed. And activities so far have been described in a general way. And while coordinating the development program, we also ask the same questions. And what will be inside the activity? And how uh, and what will be uh, funded specifically? So we are still in the process. Of course, you can inquire and ask, yes because for that 2.6 investment program objective you know is responsible the minister of the environment thank you thank you irma it's a problem with time so thank you for the discussion and for the questions so let's get over to our next presentation i would like to invite richard as well and charles as head of innovation and department minister of economy and innovation director of that department and to speak about uh, implementation of the roadmap and what are the next steps I hope you can see my slides. I see that we're short of time and we still wait for a very interesting discussion. So I will try to concentrate about the specific actions and measures. So I will speak about the other steps of our ministry. Why we think that industry 
and its role is very important and the input to the circular uh, economy enhancement. So main aspects. Just some technical issues. Maybe maybe I will continue without slides, but let's put your slides on. So now you can see. Yes, we can continue. So briefly, industry is very important for the entire economy of Lithuania. It uh, comprises one fifth of entire economy. And also we can see the numbers, export numbers, for of uh, industrial goods because uh, in Lithuania, we have more than 7,000 industrial companies, and what is also very important that success of industry is useful not only for the industry itself, but also for other sectors, logistics, services, and the industry sectors, they create more jobs in comparison to the inside of the industry itself, and also industry is very well integrated into international uh, supply chains and more than a half of their production is being exported and uh, also the success that belongs to good uh, communication internet uh, services informational decisions when we speak about uh, industry digitalization however of course, we have challenges as well in our industries. And uh, the worst thing is the productivity of industry if to compare uh, with EU. And the same thing with value, uh, also the efficiency of work. Um, we're lagging behind from European Union and one of the worst part is that industry sector is not innovative enough and uh, here we can see that essentially the bigger part of uh, productions uh, products is created low or medium technological development companies and that means that innovations they don't uh, dominate and the Lithuanian industry and uh, the value is uh, smaller and profits are smaller as well as other indexes and the briefly about funding and my colleague already presented the overall picture uh, regarding the plans for new funding uh, period and uh, we are oriented to the investments to industrial sector and more than 600 million euros of investments and we divided those into three parts for circularity 75 million digitalization you see the numbers and uh, for a neutral climate almost 450 million euros uh, till now it is very important uh, the mechanism of structural funds for the upcoming uh, period also we foresaw to allocate about 300 uh, million to industrial sector through structural funds and for industrial transformation 
also bigger attention to modifications. And when Irma also talked about this, through various loans, we will accelerate renovations. And also we will have two different uh, regions, uh, capital region and other region, and it will depend on the place of operation and the involvement will depend on that. So the package is very wide of those measures, starting from industry transformation or uh, environment friendly technologies and also digitalization, also measure for energy efficiency increase just to use, consume energy, energy more efficiently, also renewable, uh, energy, another measure to increase uh, capabilities, production capabilities, to use energies for inner uh, needs of the company or centralized networks. Another three measures for digitalization initiatives, uh, also investments planned for production automatization, also equipment with automated, integrated digital solutions. So in capital region and the middle Western Lithuanian region and also the new digital uh, centers. Um, we base this on European incentive and the services for industrial sectors. Also, we are planning to implement the measure that clients could get various consultations and other help in order to transform themselves. And as mentioned before, we don't have, we have other funding also measures for other regions for transformation for those regions who have the uh, biggest industrial companies in Lithuania and Kaunas, in Shule, in Taurage, Telshe, Klaipeda region. We have their biggest industrial companies. So we seek to help them to transform, to also create new workplaces. And uh, we have fair transformation funds allocated for that also uh, separate investments from European Commission for uh, development of centers and we will develop this in a symbiotical way. Other two funding measures, modernization fund for cleaner production technologies and also renewable uh, resources and also climate change program to change uh, hazardous uh, pollutive technologies to cleaner ones. So those are financial mechanisms. Just to look at the wider picture, the roadmap uh, we have prepared, it will become a part of the bigger overall picture of uh, the joint Lithuanian overall circular economy plan. And together with industrial transformation, we will foresee goals and actions also separate institutions and managers until 2035 to implement those goals further to 2050. If to look at our uh, perspectives from the point of view of uh, Ministry of uh, Economy and Innovative Innovation, we have two roadmaps one to integration to international value chains and the third and last part would be uh, the roadmap and we will uh, join them to one and prepare uh, one joint overall Lithuanian industry strategy also a new Lithuanian plan industry lab 4.0 enabling of it to show and help companies through virtual production lines uh, with which we can create and evaluate the future changes in production and also take decisions and move forward towards transition. If to look from the steering perspective and process, leading process we plan 
to give a big role to industrial 4.0 platform and we foresaw the role also, it will be related to constant financial measures and the last initiative we've been planning but still we haven't implemented it so it's the creation of circular economy fund for industry so here we have in my sustainable funding uh, tool when through loans uh, credits we could create uh, we could help uh, to make further green steps for lithuanian industry so briefly that's all i feel that we are short of time so thank you very much so much about our incentives and i hope that all industry participants will be active and present their proposal and conditions for their participation and implementation. Thank you, Richard, for a very <laughs> brief presentation. You saved time for us. And we have one question, Andrus Butrimas. In how many AMIN measures, um, SMEs, uh, could participate by percent mostly those that use everything and do a lot of environmental damage. So what would be the direction here? Uh, yes, the biggest attention will be would be allocated to SMEs according to all European requirements and we will not have many choices here and of course we will allocate uh, most of our attention to the changes uh, toward of SMEs and the other instruments uh, through fear transformation fund we would be able to help big companies so if to add richard i can say that if to specifically modernization fund will be allocated to big companies and also climate change uh, and other structural reform programs, the structural reform programs will be allocated to SMEs. So briefly, that's all. Thank you. I don't see any more questions or raised hands. Thank you, Richard, for your presentation. So uh, Thomas, please continue. Can you see me well? So far we see your, your screen, we don't see your slides. We have to do that once again, perhaps. better so let's let's leave as it is okay thank you for organizers of the conference also for the organizers of the co-creation i would like to say sorry to mr vaidas gritsis i change the title of the presentation in Lithuanian, it is a bit nicer because those who are listening uh, for the translation, so they know that uh, we use uh, the same word market uh, for the intersection or race, if we call about, if we speak about the secular race or intersection. So let's get back to secular economy. In the process of co-creation, where I took a quite active part, and while listening uh, to the participants of this conference, uh, I saw that there are certain discourses 
set them in indefiniteness. And we were thinking of whether, you know, if a priority is life without waste or what. And today, this question has been raised again, and that made get uh, and look deeper why this is uh, the case and where does it come from? And they had to, uh, to analyze several studies, uh, some research, quite recent research, uh, highlighting that the secular economy has no defined limits, boundaries, and clear historical foundations, uh, and that's an implementation faces structural obstacles. The secular economy is based on ideological agenda in which technical economic trends dominate and that makes a contribution to sustainability not clear and therefore it's negative and it is not easy uh, to implement and circularity is critically assessed uh, in that research practically and ideologically. By no means uh, I want to negate the economy. I just uh, like to draw attention to several aspects important to Lithuania in order to seek for competitiveness and the uh, goals of secularity. But we have to understand where all that comes from. I go further on uh, to assess uh, types. Uh, of circular economy, so we selected ecological catastrophe, innovations, we see the blue line, as you see, and the approach to social, economic, and ecological commitments uh, above is the horizontal axis, and each of the dimensions has its own discourses, two directions. Uh, segmented uh, discourses uh, with biggest attention to technical, industrial, and business uh, circularity components in order to increase uh, efficiency of resource use, uh, holistic discourses, which integrated social, political, circularity consequences. And the entirety uh, seeking for social, political, and cultural changes, and then skeptic discourses. Uh, which don't think that innovations can prevent ecological destruction and they use ecological use from the environmental usage and environmental discourses think that uh, those novelties can uh, determine decoupling and this is uh, how ecological uh, disruption could be prevented. Uh, the different uh, the differences is, uh, and uh, the combination of the differences uh, defines four narratives of secularity that you talked about to, to a certain extent today. So, uh, reformistic uh, secular society, uh, most of all transformed the society uh, in order to seek for coherence with the environment, techno uh, centrical uh, secular economy, and fortified secular economy. And the first two ones are reformistic secular economy and transformational secular society. Then the research, the study developed further on. And uh, uh, this uh, study, which by the way was uh, funded from the Horizon program, identified, established that uh, uh, the public discourse of the EU could be described as averagely uh, holistic and very optimistic, and therefore it should be uh, uh, related with the reformistic uh, secular economy type. Therefore, the EU language is so optimistic and holistic, and that means reformistic uh, 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 formation, uh, formation of the reformistic secular society, what we hear. And uh, documents uh, were analyzed over the data uh, issued by the European Commission. And it was concluded that uh, actions of the European Commission get into the technocentrical uh, uh, typology. And uh, here on the right slide, I marked it, uh, what has what is being implemented. And that most uh, probably uh, left the strategy of the European Commission, uh, you know, and the, its wish to retain its uh, uh, leaders role together. Uh, concentrating uh, towards the, the revival and recovery of economy during the stagnation period. Simply speaking, the study showed that words differ from works, and perhaps that uh, can be justified. There are reasons that can be justified knowing 
how difficult it is to adopt the decisions in the European Union. How difficult uh, these are taken in the European Union. Uh, based on the same sources, uh, uh, certain insights are provided concerning the regulation of the circular economy with terms of the uh, aims, goals, and markets, uh, which is important for Lithuania because uh, we are an exporting economy, as we all know, which is the competitiveness uh, uh, on the repair and repeated usage markets. And circularity can create conditions, uh, you know, for such markets in independent sector this way while monopolizing these markets and somebody talked already about the repair uh, activities since uh, materials are processed reprocessed recycled so uh, consumption is treated as a sustainable activity therefore becomes not a problem anymore so a german paradox is approved when efficiency of production is compensated by the growth of the usage of the uh, materials when all the uh, processing and reprocessing usage is uh, eaten up by the increased consumption. Then specific measures uh, are left for the uh, discussion of the member states, which potentially limits competitiveness on the uh, common market, uh, which is uh, uh, in particular relevant with extended uh, producer responsibility. And there are no measures uh, in the EU policy intended for social and cultural circularity access, for example, technologies of the open code, uh, also for the supply of different materials uh, and for the implementation of solidarity, what uh, has been mentioned already a little bit uh, during this conference. And finally, the uh, GBP growth and impact on the environment. And there are no directives of circularity uh, which uh, highlight the uh, importance of uh, uh, recycling, not uh, uh, the necessity to change the style of life. But we know from the dynamics that in any process of recreation, quality and quantity is lost. And that means that uh, uh, that can satisfy only part of the demand for the materials. Therefore, uh, uh, recycling alone will not be able to address the problem of the uh, limited resources. Therefore, it is necessary uh, to reduce general consumption of uh, materials, which uh, could be associated with the slowing of the economy. We will have uh, to learn to create value in those areas which do not use the resources. This is how I could rephrase and uh, waste management dominates against rational consumption. And uh, so uh, production flows are here important. And the efficiency of production in separate sectors uh, uh, then cannot be compensated uh, and also cannot be compensated because of the growth of the consumption. But I think that commission is starting uh, some actions uh, while forbidding the uh, destruction of the reserves. And the last insight is uh, maybe more of a physical character, increase of entropy because of the uh, need of the energy for recycling. Energy will always be needed and because of the growing entropy, waste and secondary products will always be created. Therefore, cycles are not possible, not practically, neither theoretically. So there will be no balance achieved and even uh, cost to processes of the circular economy will uh, result in unsustainable consumption. There will be division, entropy, and there will be losses of uh, quality and quantity. New materials and energy must be consumed to cover the losses. So these were more insights uh, taken from the uh, general approach, general attitude. Now I will jump over to the problems of Lithuania. What could be and should be important uh, for the Lithuanian politicians, uh, for uh, the formers of the diplomacy of Lithuania. I would like to reflect that. The aspects of competitiveness of Lithuanian industry in the context of European Union secular policy. Uh, it is very important that competitive uh, common EU market remains. And uh, I am glad that uh, 
uh, people talk a lot about that also in the roadmap, which is good. And this is uh, one of our diplomacy tasks so that the common market remains effective as uh, it is today. Specific measures of the European uh, legislation applied, you know, based on the disposition of member states. And that creates uh, potential conditions for protectionism and creates the dangers uh, for the action of the common market. And so it is important, knowing our industrial orientation towards export, to bear that in mind. And there we should think about. Uh, Produce as extended responsibilities and commitments and requirements in this respect. Another moment, insurance of material and non-material rise related with the product and also monopolization of the markets. It is important for repair companies to receive competitive access to repair, to the services, information, training, technical documentation, and even tools. The quality has to be ensured. And a good example would be reminding how difficult it is for the Commission to define the single standard of the charge of the, of the mobile phone. And the good news is that the Commission, as it announces in his communication, that the new right to repairs has to be instilled and the horizontal uh, rise will have to be ensured concerning the accessories, uh, spare parts, and the possibilities to provide repairs. And the same extent that the producers' uh, uh, duties uh, and that increases the prices. And one of the goals of Lithuanian industry is uh, strive to go towards order, towards, uh, to the final uh, production of the product, the additional uh, sales and marketing costs appear. So the price increases. And uh, uh, it has already been mentioned today, you know, the holistic uh, approach uh, to transformation and ensure And we have also to speak about, uh, you know, hydrogen and sustainable activities. We have to perform our homeworks, innovation technologies, in knowledge and skills, capital and investments. Uh, and we also talked about that today. So for the end, uh, I would like uh, to add that uh, European Commission achieved a lot while forming and moderating uh, uh, you know, activities of 28 uh, sovereign countries and the, the expectations concerning circular economy and the train, circular train has been already uh, released, but more holistic thinking is needed in order to show that European Union, our policy is not stuck in technical solutions and would bring the tangible ecological, social and economic changes. Thank you for listening. I tried to shorten my presentation. Uh, thanks, Thomas. Uh, thanks for the quick review over that international context. One of the things, okay, I'll start uh, from saying, uh, first of all, if uh, anyone has questions to Thomas. I don't see raised hands, uh, no questions in the chat window, but okay, uh, while reviewing briefly, I wanted to ask you concerning the repair. You mentioned that this is one of the new business opportunities. How do you see, uh, and where do you see responsibility, or where the breakthrough could be uh, achieved in this field? Um, this topic is being discussed uh, a long time ago, some seven years ago. This phenomenon has its own name, so to say. Uh, uh, which is uh, called servitization, when the company producing a product uh, uh, goes after it with all the services needed uh, to service uh, that uh, product. And what I hear now is that uh, in the context of secular economy, we are also talking about, about uh, products uh, 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 exploitation time is it possible when it is updated, renovated, repaired, and properly serviced? And in order to maintain it properly, 
é o need knowledge, training, tools, instructions, catalogs, all that uh, is possessed by the producers. And producers keeping that information, having that information acquire advantages uh, in comparison with those independent maintainers, if I can call them so. Uh, and here, the European Commission is intentive, and this is not the first case uh, that uh, they interfere into that repair uh, market. And I think that in the nearest future, they will review the directive of the services, of the main maintenance services. So we have to watch uh, this moment uh, so that access uh, for us uh, as a state is left, uh, which can invest faster. So we need uh, less capital investments uh, to such uh, areas as servicing than uh, to the production of uh, the products themselves. It is important. So the servicing sector is very important that it is competitive and accessible. I'm not sure if I answered. Yes, you did. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another question for the end. This what does uh, Varzhinskas ask? That uh, in the beginning of the presentation, you build on the publication only of one scientist, of one scholar. Uh, is it uh, sufficiently objective based uh, on the uh, one source only? Yes, this is uh, what I was afraid of, uh, and that it happened. My purpose was not to form an approach or to deny any attitude, but maybe I failed to explain properly. Uh, I had a wish to bring in some critical thinking and perception of why we behave like that and why we speak like that. Concerning studies themselves, the authors uh, that I cited, that I quoted, they are authors uh, who summed up or reviewed uh, the previous uh, studies uh, and experiences of previous uh, researchers. I didn't want to load you with too much of information, but scientists, scholars who are writing on those topics are quite many. A plenty of them, actually. If you uh, find those articles mentioned by me, you will see that they build on numerous uh, uh, resources, and a lot, a lot of quoting is provided. In any case, uh, we have to look uh, positively, and I think uh, everything is possible and can be done. But at the same time, we have to have foundations. Uh, thanks, Thomas. So, first of all, let's ask questions, more questions, he will be able to uh, contact you. Thanks for the speakers, and I would like uh, to finish the fifth session intended uh, uh, for the implementation of the industrial roadmap. And now we will get over to the sixth session, which is a panel discussion. I will try to uh, answer a question how industry can respond objectives, goals raised by the secular transformation, key challenges and new opportunities. So I would like to present members of the panel discussion. We will start from Janeta Stasishkene, who is uh, and will be speaking repeatedly, and she's member, uh, head of the team of our experts, and Kestutis uh, Masalskis, uh, who is uh, an advisor to Industry 4.0 at the Ministry of Economics and Investments, also Gintaras uh, uh, Vilda, who is uh, CNC Baltic Technologies, uh, uh, representative, uh, member of the board, and then Gediminas Reynes, who is an economic advisor uh, in the Chamber of Lithuanian uh, Crafts, uh, Industry and Trade, and uh, Gintaras Vildas, uh, who is uh, representing one of the Digital Innovation Center, uh, Production and Innovation Valley, and also, and previously was Gintar Asirim Shem, sorry, and also the Lithuanian Industrial Confederations International Innovation Expert. 
So that's all. And so let's start a discussion. I'd like to start from the representative of science, uh, from Mrs. Janetta. Uh, you are a representative of science. You communicate quite a lot also with business. Uh, what is your opinion? Uh, where could uh, business open new possibilities? What do you think? How do you see, uh, based on science, what you could offer? And the second part of the question is uh, how that need uh, that you find out about, uh, how do you reflect on it while updating or designing study programs? So this is a question for you. Hello, once again, yeah, it is great that I can speak Lithuanian language. And uh, thanks, Fidas, for your question. Uh, when you mentioned me as a representative of science, I would say that the uh, attitude in Lithuania to the cooperation of business and science changes significantly because for a long time, you know, science uh, would remain theoretical, not very closely associated with industry. So now I would say that this uh, relationship is becoming more and more close, and at least uh, KTU uh, uh, orientates its strategies uh, uh, towards the Lithuanian industry. That is encourages uh, cooperation between scientists and industrialists. In order, uh, needs of industry are satisfied in order to seek for competitiveness, not only on European markets, but on the bigger context as well. So I would think that this relationship changes. And look at from the context of the secular economy, where we foresaw that apart from what we already know, we feel a very vivid need for new uh, technologies ensuring secularity, which uh, do not make uh, secularity more expensive, but uh, rather ensure competitiveness of Lithuanian industry. Also in the context of prices, we have another thing. One thing is uh, technologies themselves that enable recycling of the materials to so close the cycle, also design of new products. And uh, here, operation is also relevant. And I think that here work uh, quite many universities of Lithuania, uh, including uh, such things like materiality, technology, technologies, economic design, and many other things. Uh, also, the presentation of new business models is important, which little by little uh, enter our market in terms of small and uh, medium-sized uh, companies, uh, which have to ensure their flexibility. So in this context, it is even more important. Uh, I would just like to encourage uh, uh, over the coming financial measures, uh, the following. We have uh, such measures uh, where science can apply, uh, Elsewhere, business can apply, but uh, it is necessary to ensure a uh, joint cooperation. Uh, interesting to note uh, that uh, in terms of secularity, our institute uh, has started some 10 years ago. Uh, it's uh, uh, the formation of its theorists, uh, which were quite utopian at that time. And uh, I know that universities are also responding to the coming changes in industry. You can find programs and modules uh, uh, for the development of main specialists, and I'm very pleased that uh, there are graduates of our university among them, not only of Commerce Technology University, but also other universities uh, with which we cooperate in different projects. Uh, we just lack one thing, and here I uh, would ask uh, for the more clear cooperation uh, of industry uh, uh, in terms of uh, specialists. When we look at the uh, advertisements, the need for such specialists is not being formulated properly, and uh, we see a problem of requalification. You know, and here we should uh, receive a very clear message from um, industry in order it formulates what it really needs and that needs is in place quite clearly. Then looking at our programs in place, I could boast that uh, 
our students, uh, they have a mandatory sustainable development module irrespective of the faculty that they are studying in. That means that we have people, we have specialists who come to industry uh, with uh, a certain respective understanding and competencies, and then there is no need for them to explain things from zero. Uh, based on secularity position, we do have master studies uh, in which uh, we have a number of modules and training uh, sessions uh, that provide quite good competencies about understanding of what is circular uh, economy, what is structure of materials and products. So bearing in mind uh, uh, the trends of the world, uh, based on the need of secularity, coming technologies and changing materials. So we also are updating our programs, our information, and we uh, adjust them uh, based on the need of uh, direct uh, consumers. Uh, and that is uh, industrial sectors. And in the formation of programs, we question about uh, needed competencies so our graduates uh, uh, try we try to direct our graduates uh, to satisfy the needs in order to ensure uh, specialists that are asked for and are needed when looking at the unions and the way how we update our things uh, perhaps i would uh, uh, refer to the application of uh, artificial intelligence. So the university responds uh, to this request uh, very well, and I think that uh, we have a good cooperation uh, with the Ministry of Economy and Innovation, but the way the innovation itself uh, promotes uh, the necessity to innovate together collaboratively. So this is a certain stimulus uh, for science uh, to catch up and also to enable our industry uh, to compete as much as possible uh, on the international markets. So that's all from my part. And if there are questions, I will be pleased to answer. Thanks, Janetta. I would uh, like uh, to clarify very briefly. You said that you coordinate your programs, your graduates work industrial uh, enterprises. Are you doing any monitoring of how many students uh, of yours work in business, in private, in public institutions? Are you uh, running such uh, informational action? Yes, we do. Uh, but if we look uh, on the national scale, so we do not have any such very specific distribution. Uh, they are employed or not employed over a certain period of time, but we follow our alumni. Uh, for example, management and production alumni, you know, and my colleague Inga Kurowski is the main person, key person who knows very well about what our alumni is doing. Alumni uh, uh, and in which areas they work. We are interested highly ourselves. We invite uh, uh, them to ask which competencies have to be updated, and this is how we adjust the content of our uh, models of studies. Thank you very much, colleagues. If you have any questions, please write uh, in the chat window. Then, after the discussion, uh, we'll be able to expand. Thanks a lot to Janetta. We have only 16 minutes left, and let's get over to the representatives of, of the Ministry of Economy and Innovations. We have an advisor, Industry uh, Point Zero, and you, Kestutis, participated in uh, co-creation processes, and uh, there have been many indications that uh, transformations of secular economy, and in general, in the field of uh, secular uh, economy, we have a big uh, fragmentation among institutions. What is your opinion? What do you think? How uh, that removal of uh, fragmentation uh, and how in this process the uh, Ministry of Economy and Innovations could contribute. And another thing, uh, what could be the further vision and which actions are foreseen in this field? Kestutis, please, you. 
Viskaros sakysiu, kad praktiškai mes jau likviduojam. I would like to say that we almost liquidated this fragmenticity, so we have only 76% of participants, of course, we have enters, of course, we have participants, and we are liquidating those necessary things. Of course, I agree that big fragmented aspect was identified, and this is a new subject in the context of Lithuania, and we it's an instrument of systemic changes and different institutions they measure circularity and then they come up with different interpretations however i believe that this fragmentation will disappear uh, time in some period of time and one part of fragmentation we liquidated already now it's important to see how we will integrate the roadmap to the Richards mentioned overall uh, circular economy plan till 2035. And here I see another perspective. I really like the presentation of uh, the Minister of Finance uh, through new planning methodology. They're looking for synergy and gaps which should be eliminated and one funding would improve other funding and i think these are very good solutions one after another and we need time to collaborate to speak to each other and to evaluate where i see the biggest problems or some remarks how to solve the problem first of all why does you know me i like to start from definition Practically, um, co-creation showed that in the beginning we spoke very differently, we had different opinions because we understood circular economy in a different ways from different perspectives and Thomas showed that uh, everyone has its own uh, attitude towards circular economy and we have to start from basic basic definition what is circular economy in the conditions of lithuania and this base definition that we propose more sustainable uh, consumption when we reuse materials etc somehow defined however the limits of the content uh, they're not finished if we speak about sustainability here we start all interpretations because sustainability is different it depends from attitudes and what components of sustainability you will put to our model and uh, i evidence that different countries differently interpret circularity some acts put accent on one thing and others on other things so from our side with the roadmap we have the definition of industry what does it mean circularity industrial circularity but how we will integrate this to a national uh, circularity plans so we have to be careful and uh, pay a lot of attention to this definition and second problem also somebody mentioned and thomas mentioned that uh, we lack holistic approach to the legislative system and holistic uh, attitude will coordinate joint vision and uh, coordinate actions because those actions they are separated disseminated in different national strategies and action plans that means that if we want to implement political um, commitments we have to reform an entire political system and also evaluate the european regulations context and also uh, sometimes in european documents we have some corridors and we have to evaluate our country specificity of our industry and uh, promote technological and uh, innovations so if we speak broadly to form a very favorable conditions to private business investments how mr brothers said that business will vote if those conditions will be favorable for them they will invest 
if not, those conditions won't be favorable, then other things will happen, of course. And fundamental changes, they are ongoing, and it is uh, very important to understand measures for the implementation of those changes. And institutional role is one of the most important ones. So to my mind, transition to circular economy has a big influence uh, in public uh, procurement. And I will not speak <laughs> because uh, it was talking a lot of, about this issue, but public procurement is one of the main motives because state invests big funds, finances to public procurement. And on the other side, those procurement could promote uh, movement towards circular economy. And the other aspect would be that uh, political policy developers, they used the statistical facts. And I'm happy that in our work, we had circular economy from the Netherlands and they adopted metabolism analysis. And this was an analysis very specific for evaluation of circularity. And we've done this for the first time. And uh, in our everyday job, uh, we cannot base everything only on statistics. So thank you, the Netherlands, that they adopted and confirmed some parameters. And now we understand where from where comes and where we have the problems. And we need this holistic approach in our everyday work because statistics usually is late or wrong uh, or misinterpret some European indicators and uh, Gintari, Gintaras, uh, I could call you the godfather of the platform 4.0 and the economy ministry in 2017 already paid attention to this problem and created collective leadership platform industry 4.0 and it was the first one in the Baltic countries and this platform on different levels coordinates academic academic community also businesses institutions and the competitiveness of uh, and communication of all of them and the last year end of last year we enhanced the activity the actions of this platform and the initial uh, platform, it was a bit narrow. And now we evolved to the circular economy uh, subject work group. And national platform consists of three levels. One, uh, industry competitiveness commission, uh, which is led by our minister. And it is a political level that has the right to apply to the government of the Lithuania also. The second coordination work group in which, which consists of uh, political developers starting from highest level institutions. And we have six work groups there consisting of experts who present the proposals and also evaluate together with statistical data and also through their expert insights, each from their own area and where they coordinate one joint uh, attitude. And this co-creation during the formation of the circular economy roadmap through this co-creation and the contact of it with the formal uh, industry 4.0 platform group, we see the synergy. And as Richard mentioned, we will search for options how to integrate the, this platform together with our industry 4.0 platform and to find joint synergy because in the future, uh, a lot of meetings await and discussions await uh, due to some moments and I think that this fragmenticity little by little through the platform and legislations and regulation and the state planning I think I think those are the ways how we can diminish the fragmentation. So briefly that's all for my part. Thank you Kirstutis you mentioned the platform and it was a nice transition 
here we have together and one of the thematic work group the lead Gintaras uh, Rimshad, he's the head of the Broad and CNC Baltic Technologies, and uh, he can speak about the challenges to uh, businesses, what they face during the phase of transformation towards circular economy, and uh, the state how it would be efficient in helping you and this roadmap is allocated not for us but for you for further development hello for everyone. hello everyone i'm very I'm sorry, sorry concerning the technological uh, shortcomings i have my the newest computer, computer and uh, uh, you cannot see me so now so you will listen to I me just like my through the radio really sorry. and you don't have the you video see what it means to install <laughs> so the computer you brand new computer uh, it's risky it is difficult to use the without new the testing uh, device but so I'm very pleased to be here to be uh, here and to be here to listen to your presentation so and that the, the theme of the green course, the green deal, uh, it and sounds a green deal, uh, uh, digitalization. Now, today, Ten years ago something it was like new, digital and now we have or industrial keywords, digitalization. There are other keywords, but without uh, taking much of your time, I would just like your attention as and an ordinary, uh, ordinary. Just the manager, owner, the CEO the of the sector, company, which is specialized in, in uh, the production uh, of uh, production of details uh, and export uh, to Switzerland and Germany, tools, and they have really high requirements. And requirements are really and high, it's usually that we hear that the, the, our so industry does not create any uh, added value. However, uh, I people don't have agree, skeptical opinions and about not such all industries of like ours, but uh, not all can. Uh, we carry can out uh, the fly and we can uh, can comply with the highest quality requirements and ensure uh, ensure added value so one moment i would like to mention when i listen to all the presentations everything is okay yes we have a problem with climate change and future generations and we cannot consume all the resources of our earth and we have to do something and one remark european union as a whole from my knowledge during glasgow conference they were named as the biggest polluters uh, uh, Europe. So, if proportionally we we'll look at that, seven percent. So, how many percent of those seven we have here in Lithuania? So, I think we would get small numbers, zero, zero point something. So, second thing, what compares those parts? If we monitor emissions, for example, different emissions in different uh, companies, we could count on one hand the main polluters, our polluters who emit most pollution and uh, emits uh, CO2. And as mentioned before, that for bigger companies, nobody foresaw any help. And maybe it's not a good idea. We have to think that the biggest polluter has to get the biggest help because he has to manage big amounts of uh, pollution. Also, another thing is very important that it was mentioned that Lithuania is an industrial country, export country, 20% of exports, this and comprises of this and this and this uh, export. For every 100%, we have to fight in a on a global market uh, and uh, compete with the entire world, India or Hungary or Poland, any other countries and uh, China. And in this fight, not always those countries win that uh, that uh, adopted all the legislation regulations. Uh, because uh, 
the price, quality, and delivery is the most important. And uh, nobody is interested, so to say, uh, in technologies, in your technologies, how you produce. Also, another thing I would like to mention, uh, the worst things, fast uh, consumption, uh, fast raise of energy costs. If the company, for example, paid some amount for electricity last year, and now we have the same same invoice for one month. So what happened? Who who's to blame? Businesses or state for those uh, enormous costs of energy? So this is the question. But we have the fact and raw materials uh, became more twice as expensive energy three four times as expensive so uh, we have to have uh, priorities in order to stay competitive on a world uh, market scale so we have to look at uh, state structures how we they could help uh, businesses because this situation is equal to everyone everyone is planning how they will work next year what measures would help them because in other countries uh, i talk communicated and they are looking for solutions and uh, if we would direct funds not to technological improvement but to waste management i don't know if it's uh, sustainable and if it's the best solution the future we will show uh, this so that that's briefly my reflection and thank you very much for this excellent event in circular economy the green deal is a necessity and we have to adopt it however we have to find a place for it and nearby we have to have in mind competitiveness also new technologies and the green deal together thank you thank you Gintaras for business point of view and visions. So often we hear that uh, in Lithuania, regional differences dominate because one region is more developed, uh, one region is more advanced or developed. So I would like to uh, I would like a word from Gedelina Freini, the Economic Advisor at Association of Lithuania Chambers of Commerce. So uh, why those differences exist? And could you illustrate with some examples? Hello. So I will answer to that question after several minutes. Most of the participants and the listeners uh, worked very intensively with the, the roadmap and i worked more with the circular economy of uh, netherlands and uh, i uh, helped them to uh, conduct a survey questionnaire and also we have uh, different companies that have very good websites you don't need to ask them you can read also other resources Oh, very good, uh, Linus Schleinotetes information and different uh, business subjects uh, showed uh, examples, very good examples of transition towards circular economy and the fact itself that uh, uh, the managers answered uh, to our questions and also shared their examples and how they understand circularity and that they are advanced in circularity. Um, for example, it is difficult to understand a person who in personal life throws uh, used tires in the forest and then comes to work and starts working. Uh, with the circular economy issue, so that's strange. Uh, so we have to speak about industrial companies, but the user is the king. And here also very important external factors. An example, if the consumer will buy a product which is packed into plastic 
uh, plastic package in comparison to cardboard uh, package so uh, circularity will move very difficultly of course uh, the managers of the companies understand the pressure uh, from the society and also taxation is promised to be increased and also everyone understands what brussels is doing and the european in the incentives if we would adopt them and implement them and the uh, textile batteries plastics converters etc so we, if we would implement those we would move forward also other aspects to mention don't forget that uh, the so the most important part of business is the profit for shareholders so it would be difficult to implement uh, funding projects that would not be profitable also another objective condition that yes lithuania exports a lot and we have the value chain however it was mentioned that in most cases in the lower value added uh, creation chain if to put simply we produce components and uh, germany france assembles and other mature economy countries so to speak about efficiency if to count technological efficiency it is really good however value efficiency uh, however the end stages of always gonna generate bigger profits so value if uh, we count is lower uh, i look very objectively towards that also i'd like to mention that the, uh, the dutch counted 3.8 circularity is a small percentage however not only the number is important but prerequisites are also very important why this number is this and not different and i spoke with the cabalist uh, leaders and also siemens producer and the copper could uh, come for example the copper from wire from secondary materials and, uh, also uh, parts could be utilized and if to speak about global cycle we can uh, redesign we can uh, recover everything so it is uh, our industry is in the initial uh, value creation chain so to speak about separate companies all measures uh, are available accessible it's difficult to say that somebody doesn't know something for toxins that producers of course uh, to decrease weight for toxins said that five years in a row they are able to decrease the weight of one bottle without uh, any environmental uh, with complying with environmental requirements also textiles however answers are very simple green energy natural materials and friendly eco-friendly dyes as the director said and we have the upcoming textile directive and uh, uh, reduce and uh, he doesn't see the rentability of the collection and the initial sorting stage and uh, we could speak again and again about the funding how to cover those black holes ergo line mild furniture in on their web page they see that weight decrease uh, and also in the furniture yeah, in the furniture sector you can refurbish and to speak about intersectoral collaboration a very interesting example about euro timber they buy land plots they plant canadian maples which grow very fast or some cultures timber cultures from italy 20 years and we have mature trees and we can lodge those trees so we have timber biofuel and also currently 
often we have the problem uh, the utilization of land and uh, it serves as a fertilizer for such trees and also uh, mushrooms grow so it, it is a nice uh, example of intersectoral collaboration so what i call the black hole and uh, irma from financial ministry also showed that we have specially designed the means so why the black hole from uh, the Ministry of Economy and Innovation. They work with the help of state health scheme and uh, they have invitations for implementation of new investment projects, also regional development. And often it's a very positive effect for energo energy. For, of course, if we have new modern production, everything will be fine with the use of materials, but often special measures would should come, uh, should be within the competence of the Ministry of Environment, like burning, for example, project toxic, uh, they are financed 100% and private initiatives like life, the minimum rule, if you know, if investment project uh, would be in, uh, implemented by the minimum project, so money would be short because they would be consumed for fairs, exhibitions, etc. So those would be my main thoughts. I, I'm very happy together with you all uh, that we have this final day, this final conference and that we implemented and we have the roadmap for circular economy. Thank you, Gedi uh, And regarding regional, my answer would be such. I thought about this a lot, so I cannot say that in Vilnius and Kaunas, companies are more productive and the managers, workers are uh, have more uh, gains, for example, less, is in a different region and please name in which region we have 100 very qualified uh, workers immediately we will have a new project uh, and we close uh, the INPP nuclear uh, plant and then we have a new company and uh, the industry is not any better in bigger cities or regions and uh, we have also other business uh, opportunities back banks public sector ministries uh, parliament fintech it more it companies we have in bigger cities but industry since soviet union uh, is uh, disseminated very equally throughout lithuania and the history what should we do with the cement fertilizers well, uh, we have to have separate uh, sign here and I had to work with Alitus Textile Bankruptcy or Drobe when the Tune uh, division was closed. So we had a lot of problems, but we received new investors, new businesses that overtake that empty place, that empty black hole. Thank you, Gediminas. Thank you for very specific examples that show that we are on the right path in the area of circular economy. And uh, it's very symbolic. I would like to pass the entire event to the platform of 4.0 as Kestudi said we have the godfather of the uh, industry 4.0 Gintaras Vilda so you will have to put the final accent so I'd like to ask you you have the experience one of the most meaningful projects on the level of the ministry in implement, successful in implement, implementation of, of those. And we see that it thrived. And uh, in your opinion, how do you see 
as we have many European incentives, European uh, industry strategy and, uh, and other related, interrelated and circular economy and in climate area. So how do you see the connection, the link with national policy? And what would be your view as an expert, recommendations from your side for the ministry? So in order to implement successfully those effective initiatives. Thank you, Vida. Thank you, Gestutis. Uh, hello, everyone, all the participants of this conference. <laughs> I was mentioned as the godfather, but I was not the only one. We had uh, many godfathers and uh, a lot of uh, social groups and uh, academic and industrial associations also added up to this work and the platform as uh, Industry 4.0 was moving forward uh, the last five years and the community expert team uh, did a very valuable work and uh, the Ministry of Economy and Innovation was in involved in the formation of this uh, policy. We have the roadmap of industry digitalization, also integration to strategic value change roadmap and also we have industrial symbiosis or transformation project which is also implemented by you and which emphasized the problems in relation to the dissemination of uh, innovations and also inclusive leadership in the regions and also we have uh, one of the problems in the region that was emphasized circularity problem and uh, clearly showed that the uh, Ministry of Economy and Innovation, they coordinate and move uh, in a very good direction uh, the work of uh, the Industry 4.0 platform. And we have to listen to all the, the social groups and we have to interconnect those documents. And Mr. Richard said a very correct phrase that a Lithuanian industrial strategy should tie Lithuania to Europe. And for this purpose, it is important to mention. Uh, Gintaras Rimsha said very well that five years ago, uh, we spoke about industry 4.0, like about circular, industrial circular economy and uh, the industrial revolution hasn't stopped. Uh, it's an ongoing process, but we are used to this process and it's uh, measured in all the researches and all the sectors are measured through the capabilities of digitalization. And if we would look how uh, the industry looks like in the terms of uh, uh, digitalization, we have leaders, ICT, mass media, financial sector, they, they really work very well in terms of digitalization. However, if you would uh, look from the other side, for example, agriculture, health sector, they still have to, they are lacking, lagging behind and they have to move forward. And the fourth revolution hasn't stopped, as I mentioned, it's an ongoing process. And this is very well communicated by European Union. And we speak about double revolution. When European Union uh, says that we have uh, uh, double uh, transformation strategies, dig digital and green, and um, to see those two phenomena, um, equal phenomena, equal revolutions with which we can open two different opportunity windows to go forward and create digital technologies and adopt them in technological companies and together start creating, developing green technologies in industrial companies. That is very important. And if to look even further, European industrial strategy named very well that we have 14 uh, co-industrial systems. And for those 14, they face 
a lot of challenges in the global world if we speak about competitiveness and competition with China and China's expansion and with expansion that is uh, distorted by funding from the state because uh, they don't have the right of competitiveness. The state just uh, allocates money and they use this money and it's difficult to compete in such an environment on a world scale. And if we want to create unified European market, it's it's condemned to lose if we will not think in Europe and apply more flexible uh, competitive uh, conditions to the help of the state. What Europe as one of the tools uh, and opened the cooperation regarding the changes of some conditions and even more regarding through the help of the state through exceptions for industrial companies to reach that new technologies including green technologies they would uh, they would enter the market they would make the first steps to the market because before that we didn't have that and now we have the opportunity with the help of the state to make those first steps to the market and it is a very strong instrument very good instrument and another very important instrument uh, infrastructural projects european infrastructural uh, projects uh, and they have uh, uh, eight strategic value change four of them are green uh, horizontal we they included the uh, automotive industry also hydrogen technologies mentioned by thomas today uh, computing also low dioxin also internet of things and cyber security and all those directions they were not created in vain uh, european union countries they agree upon those and they said that we as member states were ready to invest to common joint infrastructural projects european projects and when i listened to the discussions from financial ministry and other i did not hear that uh, we were ready uh, to allocate a part of our uh, finances to joint infrastructure, which is necessary for Lithuania in order to stay competitive in the market and to save our capability to export 80% of our production in order to stay in those strategic value chains. And, uh, I think that in this case, our collaborative approach of those who, who, uh, policy developers, academic community, uh, especially I speak about the scientific community, and I speak about innovators and uh, technology creators, developers, and uh, businessmen also. Uh, small businesses, startups, and it is of course, and of course investors. And uh, in Lithuania, we found find more and more of investors. So this joint work is very important. And we, as the cooperation of uh, industry, we always speak for uh, that uh, we need to strengthen international competitiveness. And here we have to gather. The Lithuanian politicians and the science community, entire business, and create uh, and supply products to the market that would be for uh, 
medium and high technologies development in Lithuania. Only then we can be competitive in the world uh, market and we can expect sustainable economy and uh, hopefully sustainable economy will work through applying circular economy principles. And I think those things are very important and in our final conference event, what we heard from the ministries and also experts who implemented an enormous work, they, they are very necessary for Lithuanians. So that's all for my part. Thank you, Gintaras. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the panel. So very brief resume from uh, on the first part, I heard a question maybe addressed to Lina, Khaled, and how would you uh, evaluate, was this process successful? So if to look at the content of this conference, at our discussions, and the second part, uh, which talk about implementation more, so I think, yes, we were successful, and we could treat it as a uh, uh, successful uh, practice. So thank you very much, all the colleagues, for this fruitful and interesting discussion. And we're sorry that we <laughs> could not manage time well, but the issues and questions were very important. So we wanted to listen to all of them. So thank you so much for everyone. And now uh, the word is to Simas Dunat. Uh, thank you, Vaidas. So we almost finished um, the closing part. Thank you, all the presenters and the panel and all the participants who was here with us uh, till the end. We had a very interesting, productive day and we had a lot of different thoughts and discussions. And I think those discussions will continue. We will share all the slides. You will find them on Mita website. And we start from the purpose and we have the roadmap. And uh, the word roadmap indicates that we have the direction where we want to move, uh, how to go there, how to reach that point. We have many practical uh, steps to make. So we have a big part of work that has to be accomplished. And also other actions have to be integrated to the entire Lithuanian roadmap till the 2035. And as I have the opportunity, I would like to uh, thank everyone who uh, also added up to the successful implementation of this uh, project. And thank you for uh, for the Ministry of Economy and Innovation and for your wish to apply circular economy in Lithuania. And thank you, Mita, and for my colleague, Evelina, because it would be so difficult to implement this project without you. Also, the entire Lithuanian expert team who did an enormous job and also circle economy, the experts from Netherlands and everyone, everyone, uh, coordination group members who gathered and uh, on each Friday session and also were very constructive uh, in the era of managing um, creation of the roadmap. And thanks, thank you everyone and also those who I forgot to mention and the final conclusions and closing of this conference. I would like uh, to invite the head of innovation and industry department from the Ministry of Economy and Innovation, Mr. Richardas Volanchowska. So I don't have slides, uh, I'm short of time, so my speech will, will be very brief. So thank you again, everyone, to all the presenters, the moderators, for your insights, uh, very clear uh, insights, and we heard many Things and we will have, I think, opportunities to um, look closer to those insights uh, later. And as Simas mentioned, this conference essentially is the tip of the iceberg of uh, the work that's been uh, done throughout all this period. And uh, first, thank you, colleagues from European Commission and you trusted Lithuanian gave us this unique opportunity to choose the roadmap and not all the countries had this uh, try. So 
thank you so much for this trust and for this active involvement to the development of the roadmap. So without your experience, probably we would not reach the result we have today. Thank you. And of course, thank you to all social economical partners who added up with their insights to the preparation of live document, the document that uh, will have the chances to be adopted in the best ways. And of course, the, the uh, creators of the uh, roadmap, Mita, uh, other colleagues, and the entire process was a long process. And we had so many different discussions inside and also different opinions, but that's natural. And I think that if we have different opinions and we fight for our opinions, that means we believe in what we're doing and everyone is seeking to reach the best results and uh, the best uh, efficiency in this area so thank you so much for your expectations and for your belief in this roadmap so we have the final project of this roadmap we have the roadmap now we have to implement it so it is a very important maybe even more important phase and we will face many challenges. I hope I will still work together with the majority of you, international partners, European Commission, Commission and experts in Lithuania and abroad. And I believe that uh, the results we reached, we will continue to work fruitfully. And thank you again. Very honest, big thank you to everyone. And till next time and also, and the Christmas season is coming, so have a nice uh, festive season. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.